call the December meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission to order. And we'll begin with a roll call. So our, our commissioners who are joining us remotely are not on mute. And Commissioners, you are live. Can you hear us? No, I don't think they can hear us. Well, so we're, we're calling the meeting to order. It's just gonna be a moment. How do I mute everyone? If you'll just Hi bear everyone, with us. we're working on the Do you want me to? Hey, everyone, we are working on unmuting the continuing right here. Everyone, okay. Yeah, I'm going to be unmuting the continuing right here. Everyone, boom. Got it. Can you guys hear us now on the Zoom? Oh, that's a negative. I signed them and I sent back, but I didn't save the. No. Can folks on the Zoom hear us now in the room? Okay. Yes. All right, Chair Brown, go ahead. All, all right. All right. Good morning, Good morning everyone. everyone. We'll start start this again. Uh, it is uh, 9.05. I will call the meeting, the, the December 1st meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission to order. And we will begin with a roll call. All right. Commissioner Bertrand. Present. Commissioner uh, Sandy Brown. Here. Commissioner Montesino, or uh, sorry, Commissioner Hurst. I'm right here. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Here. Commissioner Koenig. Here. Commissioner Quinn. Virtually here, alternate. Okay. <laughs> alternate <laughs> Schifrin. Here. Um, Commissioner Caput. Uh, Commissioner Caput, it looks like you are muted. We'll come back to you. Um, Commissioner McPherson? Here. Uh, is Commissioner Pegler? Here. Commissioner Rotkin? Here. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Present. And ex officio uh, Commissioner Gubbins? Here. All right, we have a quorum. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we will now take oral communications. <clears throat> oral communications is a time for members of the public to address the commission on items that are not on today's agenda. Uh, the commission will listen to communications, but in compliance with state law, will not take any action on items that are not on today's agenda. And we would ask you to say your name clearly uh, so it can be accurately recorded in the minutes of the meeting. I am looking to uh, the in-person attendees and I don't see anyone coming up to the podium, so I will call on our virtual attendees and we'll begin with Carrie. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so please, I have a PowerPoint presentation. Could you please put that up? In just a moment. One, one moment, we, well, we're working on that. There it is. And by, and by the way, I had the same problem getting connected. It didn't start until after nine o'clock like everybody. That's why I raised my hand earlier to let you guys know. All right, your presentation is up. Okay, so pay, go to the, the we, transportation topics excuse next me, page, Kirk, please. We, we actually can't see it here in chambers. our monitors. Interesting. Oh. I can see it. Can see it. Uh, yeah, we also, everybody online sees it, but not the people in the room apparently. 
It, the message that we're getting is, uh, please press input on your remote control. Hmm. Okay. Can I, can I put it in? I mean, I have it open on my thing, but. That's... Yeah, you. that's fine, Mr. Pico. Uh, I don't know why how don't we to go do to Brett Garrett to okay. start with while we work on that. Uh, so, Carrie, we'll, we'll come right sure. back around to you while sure. we work on this. Thanks. Uh, so our next speaker, our first speaker, will be Brett Garrett. Good morning. This is Brett Garrett. Thank you for letting me speak. Um, as most of you know, I've advocated for an innovative transit system along the rail corridor using small vehicles to provide on-demand travel. This system is outlined at the website railcat.org. Um, please keep an eye out on what's happening in Contra Costa County, where the Transit Authority has recently issued an RFP to build a system very similar to what I've proposed for Santa Cruz County. They already have a feasibility study based on using Glideways vehicles, which are the same vehicles suggested in the Railcat system for our rail corridors. Um, there, um, the Contra Costa RFP is broad enough that it remains to be seen what will actually get built there. But the plan is for an on-demand system very similar to the Railcat proposal. The main difference is that their system is not on a rail corridor, and it will probably have much higher ridership since it will serve three BART systems, uh, three BART stations. So please keep an eye on that. It's very exciting. Um, I know there's a big discussion about the um, rail transit on our corridor, and I just want to urge you all to please be very realistic about the limitations of a conventional kind of rail system. Um, and please try, try to address the limitations. For example, the rail corridor doesn't go near the existing transit stations in downtown Santa Cruz or the Capitola Mall, and it doesn't reach Cabrillo College. So when planning the rail system, you have to plan how, how are people going to get to those very important places? Um, how is the public transit system going to work as a whole? The proposals that I've seen are for uh, train service every half hour at the most. And given the expected cost, we should do a lot better than once every half hour. I know the EIR process will need to include alternatives. And I strongly suggest that the future EIR should include alternatives that resolve the limitations, providing better public transit for the people of Santa Cruz County. For example, the proposal at railcat.org would use existing the existing footprint of the rail corridor to create a, transport, a transit system providing convenient on-demand service almost 24 hours a day um, and maintaining the possibility to, to run freight trains during off hours. If it weren't for freight, the system would be 24 hours, but we do want to keep the possibility open for freight. Um, the system could easily extend to downtown Santa Cruz and Cabrillo College simply by dedicating space that looks like a bike lane. And it would actually provide a better energy efficient, better energy efficiency than electric trains. So I just want to urge you to please, when the um, EIR comes along, uh, please include something like the Railcat proposal among the alternatives to be studied. Uh, the website is railcat.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Garrett. We are still working on the technology, uh, Carrie. Um, I believe that's Mr. Pico. Uh, yeah, I, I can share my screen if you'd like that. I, I now have a different any. setup. So the, the issue isn't uh, with the screen share. It's with the monitors here in the... Um, in the chambers. Yeah, you know, we were seeing it online, Carrie. We just, we, we can't see it in the, meet, meet, in the meeting room. Can you just let him share screen? Would, would you like me to you read guys it off it, and then right? by the time they sort it out, they can, maybe you'll see it because it's really, the info is, I want you to hear it, but I also want you to have it as a documentation at the end. So should I just start? Mm -hmm. Do that to we can send it out afterwards. Yeah, that'd be fine. Yeah, let's okay. go ahead and uh, you can have an opportunity to speak now and we'll make sure that all commissioners have a copy of your your slides. Okay, let me see if this works, by the way. But we'll see if, I guess it doesn't share a screen. So uh, I'm, I'm interested in that everybody understand the highway facts as well as the trail facts. So it's... I've heard much misstated information coming from the RTC. So this is important information. 
starting with every day about on average 228,000 uh, vehicles use Highway 1 daily, not 100,000, 228,000. Now, focusing on Watsonville, since that's also a big highlight, I, about 42% um, commute daily onto Highway 9, uh, Highway 1. Of those, half of all Highway 1 traffic that passes Buena Vista coming north comes from Monterey County. Did you hear that? Half of the Highway 1 traffic passing Buena Vista comes from Monterey County. Of the Watsonville commu uh, uh, residents commuting, that means about the 42% using Highway 1, that's 42% of all Watsonville workers, 48%, uh, almost half, go to the Bay Area or Scotts Valley. They take Highway 17, 48%. Only 22% go to Santa Cruz. This comes from a, a variety of Caltrans data. Um, I'm sorry, uh, U.S. Census Bureau data. Uh, Santa Cruz at the fish hook, they all think that everybody's coming into town. 50 to 60 percent take the fish hook going on to 17 North. The, uh, the rest continue straight. I don't know where they go. And county, I just want you to know that it costs 15 under 15 million per mile to build a new freeway. That's from remember that number. Right, Mr. Sorry, you're breaking up that last comment. Uh, uh, we couldn't hear it. Mr. Pico, okay. we're yeah, we can't hear you. Uh, 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 you give me one second. I don't know why it's not. Let me get close. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you're you're kind uh -oh. of in and out. You're me? breaking up a little bit. I don't um, think it's on our end, and no. he has about 30 seconds left to wrap up this. Well, uh, anyway, so now let's get to the, the trails, which is, I'm right next to a router, so it should work. Uh, right, um, the trail stuff, it costs 2.7 2. million per mile for a smart rail trail. Um, Santa Cruz County at segment seven did 5.3 per mile, but there's more street crossings. Phase two is 17.4 million per mile. Segment nine at, for 45 million for 1.7 miles is 26.4 million per mile. And when I say that, I've taken out uh, uh, 3 million for segment eight, which is the boardwalk and painted new projects. And this, I really want you to understand the concrete emissions for project nine, that section puts out 5.8 puts out CO2 emissions, which is equivalent to 5.8 million car miles. If you're to take the expected bicycle riders, you're going to take over 30 years to recoup the CO2 emissions. So I'm trying to tell you that it's the cost, the cost is terrible and it's environmentally unfriendly to do Section 9 and anything else that's on rough terrain. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pico. And did anybody ever get to see the, the project, the, we, the PowerPoint? Not as of yet, but we will make sure to review it once we... Uh, every, everybody online saw it, including their commission yeah. members, but yeah, not the people in the room. Yeah. And, and one last point, you really need Mr. to have... Mr. Pico, uh, okay. your, your time's up. Your time is up. I'm, I'm sorry, okay. we did okay. give you a little you extra time due to the Thank technical you. difficulties. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up is Brian Peoples. Hi, this is Brian. This is Brian from Trail Now. Um, I just want to emphasize uh, I've known Kerry for I think seven years, and he's very been providing this technical information for years to the RTC, and the RTC hasn't really been listening to these facts. And uh, so I think it's important that we start looking at it from an engineering economical position rather than public opinion. You know, public opinion is really driving our community to do not smart things environmentally. I mean, we're destroying 400 trees, heritage trees. These are trees you can't even put your arms around for segment nine, just because of public opinion. Um, and and the, the, the cost, when you talk about the cost that we're spending, the money we're spending, because we think the public, the public wants this, um, it's more, costs more to build your trail than widening the highway. That's crazy. 
When Smart did it for two million a mile, and we're spending twenty six million a mile for a trail that actually destroys the environment, four hundred trees. I think we really need to step back and and look and say, you know, what is driving our our decisions here? You know, years ago in two thousand four there was public opinion that we didn't need to widen the highway. Well, the result is, is that we created more pollution. We're making our community unsafe because we have people speeding through our neighborhoods to, to do the shortcuts, so to say. Um, most public agencies, um, the staff drives it, the decisions and strategies of CONOPS uh, via engineering. You know, yes, you, you get public viewpoint, but when that public viewpoint makes it worse for the environment, works for our community, then we know something's wrong. Now, finally, I wanna to just touch on the Measure D and the assumption that uh, the failure of Measure D Greenway uh, makes it so the public wants a train. That's not the case. Uh, the public voted against Measure D for multiple reasons. And actually, the data shows the main reason was because they wanted to save the beach train which was a actual lie because um, the beach train uh, is actually, if you have an electric train, your beach train goes away. With the Greenway Measure D, actually the beach train was to sort of stay. So there's a lot of misconceptions that we think that Measure D failure is, oh, the public wants a train. That's, that's not true. And more importantly, it's it, even if they do want it, we can't have that because it doesn't make it sense environmentally, doesn't make sense transportation wise, nor does it make sense economically. We can't afford to continue to spend $20 seconds. million dollars a mile for a substandard narrow trail. So again, I just want to thank Kerry for his continued detailed work. And I really encourage you to look at his data because it is factual. He was an MIT uh, tech uh, researcher. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Do, I don't have access to the participants right now to see. Okay. No other hands are okay. raised. Uh, so we, uh, seeing no other uh, members of the public for oral communications, we will, um, let's see, are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Um, there are some changes, uh, Chair Brown. Um, first off, there was a revised agenda that was issued. And uh, referencing page four of the revised agenda, um, we need to add an item 21A before closed session for review of items to be discussed in closed session. In addition, um, after closed session, we will need to have another open session. And as you can see, there's two items 22 listed. So um, closed session will become 22A. And when we open up open session again, item 22B will be report out from closed session followed by item 22C next meetings. And my apologies for the confusion on the agenda. It was difficult getting this out Thanksgiving week with a bunch of add-ons as well. In addition to that, um, please be aware there is a replacement page for item six and handout for item seven, an add-on page for item 12, a staff report for item 20, and a handout for item 20, all of which came out after the original agenda and is posted to our website. Thank you. My revised agenda doesn't show a 22. That's correct. Yeah. That's why I was adding them now. So it's, not on the it's not on the agenda. We missed noting that we needed to um, discuss the items in closed session and then report out. And that's the clarification. So the, the substantive item was listed, but the order and the number letter combos were different. That's Got correct. It. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we will now move on to our consent agenda. 
Uh, the consent agenda is items today, items four through 14. All items appearing on the consent agenda are uh, considered to be minor or non-controversial and will be acted upon in one motion if no member of the RTC or public wishes an item removed and discussed on the regular agenda. Uh, members of the commission may ask questions or seek clarification and uh, direction on the consent agenda without removing the item. I'll ask my colleagues if anyone has an item you'd like to um, either ask a question about, comment on, or pull. I have a question about the procedure. And as I understand it, members of the public can ask that. Andy, we can't hear you. You have to be louder. I think you need to turn your... <laughs> I, my understanding is that members of the public can ask to have an item Correct. pulled. Um, they can comment on any item, but it's a commissioner that needs to pull an item. Correct. I just wanted to clarify. Yes. Sorry if that wasn't clear. I'm using my script, but the, yes, um, any member of the public may request that an item be pulled. Um, yes. So thank you for the clarification on procedure. I'll ask my colleagues in the room and on Zoom if you have any agenda items you'd like to uh, ask a question about, comment on, or poll. I do not see anyone. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, entertain a motion for the consent. Actually, there. Oh, no, I'm sorry. We're not. We're not. I'm sorry. I just got lost for a second there. Um, I see Mr. Hurst. Uh, Commissioner Hurst has, your, has his hand up. So we'll we'll go to Commissioner Hurst and then out to the public. Thank, uh, thank you. you, Chair. Just to move the meeting along, I would move the consent agenda. Commissioner Hurst, we're going to wait until the, for the public to uh, come and speak on this item or, or on the consent agenda. I will take it out to the public now. And um, I do see one hand up in uh, the virtual world. Brian Peoples. Uh, Mr. Chair. Peoples, you are yeah, up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Commissioner uh, Chairman Brown. Uh, this is Brian. I just wanted to comment on item number six, the man Risa and the California Trans uh, California Coastal Commission approval, which was a minor approval. They basically gave us a waiver. And just to re-emphasize um, the importance for this commission to understand the regulations of the California Coastal Commission. You know, a lot of the coastal corridor runs within 20 feet of the um, the ocean. I was over actually riding my bike past Park Ave over in Capitola where the tracks are essentially 20 feet. They're up on that big cliff hanging over. Um, the, the Coastal Commission has uh, rejected three uh, Santa Cruz County um, efforts related to projects that Santa Cruz County, including the RTC, has proposed to do. And so I think it's really important for this agency to pull back a little bit and understand when you're doing designs and when you're doing long-term planning that you incorporate the legality of it. It's, it's, it's not appropriate for us to spend tax dollars on designs and planning, long-term planning that doesn't meet the Coastal Commission requirements. It's pretty straightforward. It's, it, you don't need to be a rocket scientist to understand that the Coastal Commission is placing huge, huge requirements on this agency and the property that they own. So please, uh, as you go through and you do your long-term planning, I encourage you to, to revisit and understand, you know, just the experience you had with the Manresa and the Davenport uh, Coastal Commission rejection of those projects. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Do we have any other members of the public who'd like to comment on our consent agenda? I'll second Mr. Hertz's motion to approve the consent agenda. Oh, great, thank you. So we do have a motion to approve the consent agenda by Commissioner Hurst, a second by Commissioner Schifrin, and we will take a roll call vote. Commissioner Bertrand. I approve. Sandy Brown. Aye. Hurst. Aye. Randy Johnson. Aye. Koenig. Aye. Quinn. Yes. Schifrin. Aye. Caput. Um, I'll, I'll vote if he's, if he's not in. Aye. Hey, Hernandez. Um, McPherson. Aye. 
Pegler? Aye. Rotkin? Aye. Kristen Brown? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. Uh, excuse me? Ar Ari Parker's okay. here. Ari Parker's been here except for I couldn't get on. I'm in science camp, guys. So it's a little <laughs> intermittent for us, but I've been here since about nine after. Okay, so um, we will have Commissioner Pegler serve as the alternate instead. And we'll... Unless, right. and so Larry, I'm sorry, but uh, with the rain, I might get kicked off. Um, just to let you know, but I'm here for the duration. Yeah, I didn't know you and were able to make I it too. at all today. Yes. Okay, well, I'll take Commissioner Parker's vote on that. Sorry, Commissioner Pegler. All right, thank you for the clarification. Uh, we... That motion passes unanimously, and we will now move on to our regular agenda. And our first item is commissioner reports. I see uh, Vice Chair Koenig, you have a report. I do. For it. Yes, thank you, Chair. On November 13th and 14th, I had the opportunity to attend the Self-Help Counties Coalition Focus on the Future Conference with our own senior, senior transportation engineer, Sarah Christensen. Um, this is a conference of counties that have passed self-help tax measures like our own Measure D uh, and are looking at future investments. So it's a great opportunity to gain some perspective on what's going on statewide. Uh, first off, I, we saw our own consultants, Mark Thomas, presenting on our bus on shoulder and auxiliary lane project. And it was really exciting to see some of the latest renderings. Um, and I hope the commission will get a chance to see, the whole commission will get a chance to see some of those soon. Um, it is really uh, impactful to see how long some of those um, transition periods are between entry and exits that are really going to allow the bus on shoulder to gain a lot of time. Um, I think that comes through in the latest renderings. And, um, and overall, they did a great job job representing the project at the conference. It also became clear that our county is really uniquely positioned in the state because of our diverse spending plan on Measure D. You know, a lot of other uh, of these other counties that have passed self-help uh, um, funding initiatives have expenditure plans that really focus on spending for the highway. And that really limits them when they're going after state dollars because the state doesn't want to fund just highway projects. They want to see multimodal projects. So the fact that we have a diverse expenditure plan for Measure D has really uniquely positioned us. That's why I think we've done so well on uh, some of these grant applications and, and hopefully we'll continue to. Uh, we heard also just from a variety of, of different folks. Um, you know, if you hear some particularly from the, the Bay Area, our neighbors to the north. So uh, we heard from Newell Arnich, who's the mayor of Danville, uh, about how things are progressing with their Iron Horse Trail, uh, which is a, a rail banked line there. They're starting to, they're seeing that it's so popular, they are looking for ways to begin to divide um, wheeled you know, bike traffic from pedestrian traffic, as well as looking for options for autonomous vehicles on that trail. From uh, Tim Hale, the executive director of Contra Costa, Contra Costa County, as we heard earlier in public comment, um, they are doing more with autonomous vehicles, including uh, a full level four, that's uh, fully autonomous vehicles for public use uh, in Rossmore, a senior community center, and as well as in the city of Martinez as a way to get uh, from the city center to the hospital. Um, and those autonomous vehicles would have wheelchair loading. So that's interesting. Um, we also heard from uh, Santa Clara County, um, the, the VTA there uh, is looking at some serious challenges. Um, so Deborah Dang, Chief Planning and, and Programming Officer, uh, just talking about the fact that the VTA is facing a fiscal cliff as COVID funding goes away um, and that they are concerned they don't have enough permanent money for transit operations. Um, I mean, this is coming from a county that has a sales tax in perpetuity, $10 vehicle license fee, um, and a number of other uh, local funding measures that just that really uh, put them far ahead and they're still facing these challenges. Uh, we also heard from April Chan, uh, GM and CEO of um, in, in San Mateo County um, that um, they're seeing about 70% of, um, of, or I think 76, sorry, let me go back there. Um, they're seeing that fair revenue, which had accounted, had accounted for about 70% of Caltrain's revenue before the pandemic is down to less than 30% of the overall revenue. Um, and so they're facing a, a big challenges at funding with Caltrain as well. Um, their buses continue to do well though. Um, 
Finally, there was a uh, breakout session on community outreach. We heard from Jody Litvak at LA Metro, uh, who's talking about better ways to do public outreach, uh, including uh, having meetings at different times of day, using translators and social media to get the word out, going to other people's events, um, so really partnering with community organizations. Um, so rather than so to, to go to groups of people who are already meeting for other reasons and, and helping to talk about transit um, and other projects, rather than expecting everyone to uh, come to our RTC meetings all the time. So overall, great conference and really good perspective on what's going on throughout the state. That's all. Thank, thank you. you. That was really informative. I appreciated it. <clears throat> yes, thank you. I, uh, Commissioner McPherson. Yeah. Um, I, um, as uh, the representative of, of Santa Cruz County to the California State Association of Counties, I attended our annual session down in Orange County last month. And uh, one of the presenters, I'm on the Coastal Committee of that organization of CSAC. Uh, and uh, the Coastal Commission executives uh, address on general issues about it. And I just told him about the importance of the Coastal Commission giving us a, a clear identification of what can or cannot be done on, along the coastal routes of Santa Cruz County. Uh, we are following up on that and I uh, just want to let you know that uh, it is something <clears throat> the Coastal Commission is aware of, obviously, but uh, I told him that it would really help if we could get a definitive answer of what can or cannot be done along that corridor along the coastal area. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, you're up. I'll just make a little comment. Um, exactly, you're gonna have to give me a, a little help here. So what is the organization that um, I go to with you? It, it has a complicated name about transportation issues on this uh, county. It's the Coastal Rail um, Coordinating Council. Okay, Coastal Rail Coordinating Council. So I'll be off the council here. And so I'm giving a plug to the Coastal Rail Coordinating Council. So for any members of this commission who are truly interested in rail issues and connecting from the north to the south and all the different uh, problems that the communities along that route, the various routes, are doing in terms of stations and in terms of trying to work with freight issues and such like that and get funding for their local issues to improve transportation. I, I suggest that you go to this meeting. Uh, it's usually virtual, sometimes it's in person. Um, you get a pretty clear idea of all the issues from San Francisco all the way down south for this area. And um, you meet a lot of interesting people that are involved in transportation issues. And so they are also great resources for you in terms of trying to understand general transportation issues that we face and also the other communities in this area face. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. Uh, if I could ask, how often do those do the does the council meet? Not very often. <laughs> Just for, for commissioners who are thinking about this. It's about every three to four months and they are Brown Act meetings. Um, so they will be um, very much in person um, due to the new um, or the lifting of the state of emergency by the governor. So um, they do require a certain amount of travel. Could we get staff to give us a, um, a listing of when the meetings are going to be? Sure. Um, I will make sure that that is included in the next agenda package. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let's see. For Commissioner Hernandez, I see your hand up. Reports. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So I got the opportunity to attend uh, and participate in the vigil for World Day of Remembrance for traffic victims who have been killed in Watsonville. Uh, and, and, you know, it was put on by the our, our county's Community Traffic Safety Coalition and Watsonville's Vision Zero Group. And, you know, a few people attended, Caltrans, uh, Public Works folks. But, you know, it really uh, reminds us that the, our roads are for everyone. And we really need to keep in mind that we need to uh, put uh, bike and pedestrian infrastructure in place uh, to really uh, ensure equity and we ensure that roads are for everyone. So just want to put that reminder out there for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Always important to think about. Yes. 
So we will now move on to item 16. Uh, and we now have an opportunity to express our appreciation for uh, outgoing commissioners. Uh, these are um, Commissioner Bertrand, Commissioner Caput, Commissioner Coonerty, uh, Commissioner Alternate Hurst, and retiring Caltrans ex officio, Tim Gubbins. So um, I do have some certificates here. On, they're on my uh, screen and I'd like to read them and, and share them and, and speak just for a moment about each of the uh, commissioners who are coming to the end of their terms. Before um, you do that, um, yes. uh, Commissioner Kennedy asked me to express his apologies for his inability sure. to be here today. He's at a conference in Washington, D.C. and just is unable to attend. So he, he did want me to express his apologies. Thank you. Um, understood. We'll, we'll uh, honor him in absentia today. Um, all right. So I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, and then we'll give an opportunity for outgoing commissioners to say a few words. Um, I am I'm going to begin with uh, Jacques Bertrand here to my left. Uh, we and you can see the award which you will receive <laughs> on when we get them printed. We had some technical difficulties, um, um, but we want to recognize you. The RTC wants to recognize you for your seven years working to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County as a commissioner. Uh, and years of service advocating for transportation improvements in Capitola um, and the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, demonstrating focused leadership and advocacy for the needs of our community, uh, supporting the Unified Corridor Investment Study and your careful attention. Careful attention is absolutely uh, <laughs> accurate there to transportation funding and budgeting. Um, you've served on the Budget and Personnel Committee and the Coastal Rail Coordinating Council, and we uh, sincerely appreciate your service. Thank you. And I'll give you a moment to say a few words. Okay. Um, so um, truly you recognize that I was concerned about um, funding issues. That's one of the real reasons why I stepped on. Um, so let's go back a little bit. Um, when I first moved to Capitola, I got pulled in by Dennis Norton. And a lot of people here may remember Dennis Norton, a former city council person, Capitola. And he says, we got this great opportunity to buy the rail quarter. What's the rail quarter? And um, well, I know there's some tracks going through the county. And he explained it to me and he explained the possibilities that this presented to the community of Santa Cruz. So I said, sure, this makes a lot of sense. Um, I came and talked to this board, one of the board of supervisors, and you know, definitely supported the issue. Well, we bought it. When I chose to become a member of this body, it was for fiscal issues. So a lot of you may not know, but I went to the Penn Institute, got a master's in public policy, and my focus, you take extra course, sort of like a minor, was on municipal finance and all the issues pertaining to that. So and then I also became treasurer at Capitola for eight years. So the main thing is when you spend money on something, you take away the possibility of spending money on something else. It, it's almost zero sum unless we have a rising tide and the boat goes up. So I wanted to make sure of all things that we focus on finance issues. If it ever comes to a public ballot, I hope that this commission makes sure that we do have the proper financing. And I think that's the thing that we have to focus on as a community. The issue of whether or not we need something like this to me has always been something that is transparently positive. We do need alternate quarters for transportation. I certainly support the idea of a trail. I think that many people do. How we get there and is it affordable, I think is very critical. So I'll repeat, as you spend money on something, you take away the ability to spend on something else. So the benefit for what we do has to be so large in comparison to anything else we may want to spend on that it's worth it. And I will always be focused on that. I won't be on this commission, but I'll still focus on that as a member of this uh, community of Capitola and Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bertrand. So our next honoree is Commissioner Caput. Uh, I think you're there. 
and I have a few words to say. You will receive your certificate. Um, we'll, we'll get it to you. I'll deliver it if needed. Uh, okay, so Commissioner Caput, we are recognizing your 12 years of dedication to improving transportation in Santa Cruz County as a commissioner at the RTC. Uh, demonstrating leadership and advocacy for for residents, uh, school children in southern in in South Santa Cruz County and the Greater Pajaro Valley. You, I'll just say you you really have been such an advocate for uh, your constituents in South County. So I want to highlight that um, your support of the corridor investment study and the transit corridor alternative transit corridor alternatives analysis um, and advocacy for projects around state routes 129, 152, Highway 1, and the farm roads and rail corridor, um, as well as bicycle, pedestrian, and specialized transportation projects and programs. Uh, so we want to thank you, Commissioner Caput. Uh, and if you're here, um, I see your screens off, but if you are here, uh, give you an opportunity to make some comments. Okay. I think we will keep moving along then. And um, so this will be an, an absentia recognition for Commissioner Coonerty um, for eight years working to improve transportation in Santa Cruz County as a commissioner. Uh, demonstrating focused leadership and advocacy for the needs of the Santa Cruz County community as well, um, garnering support for uh, the passage of Measure D in 2016, the Unified Corridors Investment Study and the Transit Corridor Alternative Analysis, your dedication to transportation projects on the north coast of Santa Cruz County, including the Coastal Rail Trail and um, bike pet and safety projects in Davenport. Uh, uh, thank you for being an advocate for your constituents on the North Coast. And no comments from Commissioner Coonerty, who is in DC. So um, I'm gonna move on now to uh, Commissioner Hurst, Commissioner Alternate Hurst, um, a steady presence at the RTC for, for many years. And I imagine we'll, we'll keep hearing from you um, and look forward to that. Um, but we want to recognize you today for your outstanding dedication and public service as an alternate with the RTC. Uh, thank you for your advocacy for the needs of all users of our transportation system, including bicyclists, pedestrians, transit users, motorists, and the entire Watsonville community. Uh, you've garnered support to help ensure the passage of Measure D served as an alternate on the Budget and Administration and Personnel Committee and your dedication to transportation in Santa Cruz County um, to not just meet the needs of current residents, but also for future generations. And so we thank you for your service and uh, we'll give you an opportunity to say a few words. Well, thank you, Chair, and, and I want to thank all the other uh, RTC uh, panelists and participants and, and the public as well. You know, none of us uh, get here by ourselves, and transportation's like that, too. We need a lot of different infrastructures. We need a lot of different ways to, to move folks. And, and in South County, you know, we've been really perplexed and stymied in, in the past in some cases, and just trying to... Um, you know, make sure our workforce is able to get to work and that uh, access to better transportation can take place. Lots of good things are happening uh, just to our south in Monterey County with Tamsi and, and their efforts to improve uh, highways and rail transportation as well and their bus service. And so it's, it's an honor to uh, assist in Santa Cruz County and, and try and bring better opportunities for our South County residents in particular, but it's not just them, it's visitors coming to uh, spend money and visit our community. It's uh, job creators and makers of employment. We have a, a wonderful opportunity ahead of us and a, and a bright future. And I would encourage everyone to uh, stay involved as much as they can and um, let's get people moving. Thank you. Thank you. I look forward to hearing you say that uh, in the coming years as well. <laughs> okay, our our last uh, certificate of recognition 
Uh, I'll be presenting to Tim Gubbins, uh, Caltrans District 5 Director. Uh, today we're recognizing your retirement from Caltrans after decades of public service as a Caltrans engineer, project manager and uh, deputy district director, director and ex officio member of this body. Your dedication to long range planning and commitment to engaging the public and transportation partners has really been instrumental in development of uh, multimodal safety projects along Highway 9 through the San Lorenzo Valley, uh, Highways 129 and 152 in Watsonville, the Highway 17 Wildlife Crossing, uh, improvements to Highway 1 along the entire length of the county, and numerous planning efforts, uh, including the Highway 1 Corridor Plans, Highway 17 Access Management Plan, uh, the Highway 9 San Lorenzo Valley Corridor Plan, the Unified Corridor Investment Study, and Advanced Mitigation Planning. Uh, as District 5's director, you've always emphasized the partnerships as key in overcoming challenges. And uh, we, we just so appreciate your longstanding partnership with the RTC and wish you well in your future endeavors. And so I'd like to give a, a round of applause to all of our awardees and then give you a moment, Tim, to speak. Mr. Govins. All right, all right. Thank, thank, thank you, Chair and Commissioners. And yes, it, it's a strange feeling, but uh, after 35 years with Caltrans, um, and over 10 as the district director, it's time for me to move on to the next stage. And uh, I just wanted to say it's over those 10 plus years and even earlier, it's been an honor to be part of this commission and then working in partnership with this commission on, on all of those long-term planning efforts that you just mentioned, delivering critical projects and, ha and having the planning and the, and the plans in place for when, for when we had opportunities to actually implement them. So, uh, Thank, thank you for the ability to partner with you, and uh, I, I look forward to my next step, but I'm sure that, you know, these partnerships will continue long into the future. So thank you. Thank you. One more. All right. We, I, I'm going to take it out to commissioners for comments. Uh, Commissioner McPherson, you're up first, and Commissioner Rock, and I see you. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank each and every one of the commissioners, uh, the retiring commissioners for their really interest and uh, consistent uh, consistency in discussing these matters and how they've done it. Um, you know, uh, we've had some split votes and some intense conversations here, but unlike federal and state officials, they've been civil discussions. And that's what I really appreciate more than anything, that uh, we've had really six to six votes, as we know, and so forth. And, uh, and you know, over some really... Uh, uh, so we, like I said, intense discussions, but I really want to thank the commissioners and all of us, but especially those who are retiring for their, their really civil discussion that we've had. Um, and uh, particularly to Mr. Gubbins and Caltrans in, in general, I just want to thank him for uh, his attention to this county always. And uh, I, I'd just like to get even more honed in on this about the 5th District and what has happened there a lot every every um every month we get these projects under construction and there's usually two a couple dozen of them and regularly that um, about half of them are in or adjacent to the fifth supervisorial district which i represent and two um two of them uh in particular the wildlife crossing is just completed which is a fantastic first of its kind in the state uh that has happened uh it's going to be really a, a safety issue uh and a, a humanitarian or a, an animal friendly issue for sure so i just uh that is a huge project and we did it here in santa cruz county because of caltrans's cooperation and leadership from mr govins and I'd like to, his, one of his assistants, John Olenek, just to say how much I appreciate him. We have the San Lorenzo Valley Corridor. This is kind of unlike any other project too. When you have five agencies, you have the state, you have the county, you have um, the RTC, you have Metro, the school district. This is not easy to coordinate the efforts. And uh, it's been done really well under the leadership of Mr. Govins. And uh, I don't know if he's had any other project quite like that or this, but... Um, I just want to say, uh, as a, uh, the district representative from uh, Fifth Supervisorial District, uh, it's, it's a long time. It takes more time than you ever want, but it is really uh, going to be a real great safety addition 
and a uh, convenience addition to the San Lorenzo Valley in particular. So uh, done a special job on some special projects here. And thank you, Mr. Gubbins and your, your associates and uh, to all the retiring board members too. I really appreciate your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Rodkin. Uh, well, I'm Bruce took part of my uh, fire away here. I totally agree with his comments. Um, I want to say, first starting with uh, Mr. Govins, the uh, our, our cooperation with Caltrans is, is, under his leadership has been incredibly positive. And it, it was not always thus, I have to say. We <laughs> Before his service, we often found ourselves at odds and not working very well together and feeling we were being, frankly, oppressed by Caltrans and a lot of our local projects. And that has not been the case under Tim Gubbins. And so we really need to appreciate the way Caltrans has addressed itself to our local needs in this community. Um, and I want to say for all the other uh, commissioners and their alternates, um, these are not people that have just been warming seats. Um, these are people that have been active. And uh, as, as Bruce McPherson was saying, um, they've been strong advocates for things and often um, you know, have to speak out loudly to sort of get the attention of the matter, the things that matter to their uh, constituents and their communities. And but they've done it in a way that's very different than what we've seen at the national level in terms of the, the, the quality of the discussion. And it's been done in a way that's been effective. And that's the most important thing to say about it. I mean, people can complain about things, but it doesn't always result in change in a positive direction. But every one of these commissioners have worked in a way uh, actively with the rest of the, the commission in a way that's been very, very positive. Uh, even when, again, they were pressing us to change what we were doing or pressing us to put more attention on the matter that really was a concern to their area of the county. So um, I just want to really recognize that, that I don't take that for granted. And we have lots of examples, counter examples around the rest of this nation about how it's done badly. And these have been people who've had really a positive impact on transportation issues in our county. Thank you for your service. Hey, yes, Commissioner Bertrand, go for it. And and Commissioner Caput, I saw your your face for a moment, and I wanted to offer you an opportunity to speak up if you are there. For the moment, uh, Commissioner Bertrand, I'll I'll give you the mic one more time. Yeah, I have to say one more thing, and um, you know, I think a lot of us have been on multiple commissions and multiple committees and elected positions, perhaps. And one thing that's always apparent is the effectiveness of the effort is truly the people that are on that committee and on that commission and how well you work together. But the other unsung heroes, heroines are the staff people. And, you know, since I've been on this commission, I've noticed great changes in the staff and great examples of professional focus on achieving the aims of the commission, but achieving them in a way that means that people are working together. They're working with Caltrans, knowing how to do that in an effective way. Really amazing to me. And I did not know this before I became an elected official in Capitola. You know, a lot of people complain about staff and for all sorts of reasons, but if you really want to know how much we depend on staff, you need to get elected. And I'm saying that in that way because you really truly can't know unless you're truly involved in that committee or in that body. So thank you for being here. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see no additional hands up. And that means we will move on to our next item. This is item 17, election of chair and vice chair. Uh, this will be pretty quick, I, I do believe. Um, I, I just wanna um, make a couple of remarks um, as the outgoing chair very briefly. Um, but first I'll um, go ahead and give a report from our uh, commit subcommittee that met uh, or that spoke uh, consisting of myself, Commissioner Rockin and Commissioner McPherson. And um, as we were uh, 
discussing how to proceed with our nominations, um, we uh, decided that we want to recommend uh, Commissioner Koenig to move into the chair position. Uh, he has been vice chair and served as well uh, this past year. And um, our vice chair, uh, Kristen Brown, Commissioner Brown, uh, who has uh, served on our commission, uh, been a, a thoughtful and active part participant, and I know to be uh, a wonderful uh, uh, presiding officer of meetings from my experience at AMBAG. <laughs> and um, so I'll um, just put that out there and see if uh, any, if our committee members would like to say anything. I'd move approval we'll go ahead and make of a recommendation. the uh, nomination. The Nominations for chair and vice chair from and I'll, nomination committee. I'll, I'll second those as a member of that committee as, as well as the commission. All right, we have a motion on the floor from Commissioner Schifrin uh, to nominate uh, Commissioner Koenig to the chair position and Commissioner Brown, Kristen Brown to the vice chair position. Um, and we have a tie for second, the second one they had. I'll give it to Commissioner Bertrand today uh, as an outgoing uh, member. And um, then I will ask if any members of the public have any comments about this recommendation, the motion. I guess we did make the motion before I went out to comment. Um, I see Commissioner Koenig, go for it. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to thank you for uh, your work throughout this past year. Um, you know, people often think that um, Chair comes with a lot more power, but really it's mostly a lot more responsibility uh, and, and work as far as uh, both reviewing the agenda, signing documents. Um, and I thought you've done an excellent job throughout the year uh, guiding us through some difficult issues. Um, and, and thank you for your work. And, and also second that I think uh, Commissioner Brown is uh, excellent at presiding at meetings. Uh, seeing her work on MBAG as well, and um, we look forward to having her as vice chair. Wonderful. Okay, I, I do want to just say a couple of things. Um, I'm uh, the outgoing chair. I am uh, going to, as far as I know, remain on this commission, um, and I so I won't make a lot of comments. But I just want to really thank um, a whole lot of people who are sitting in this room and uh, people beyond this room for the support you've given me. I want to thank really thank our staff, um, Director Preston. You have. Uh, been amazing to work with as chair uh, in helping me understand the issues, uh, the intricacies of the um, agenda items that come before us. This is really complicated stuff. Um, and, you know, you just make it, um, you know, you make it uh, a pleasure to, to try to work through um, and think through those uh, issues. Um, I want to thank, uh, you know, I've all I, I'd like to just say thanks to everybody in the room. There's a lot, all of the staff at the RTC. I mean, I am just always inspired, impressed, inspired uh, by the work you do, your commitment um, and the, the amazing level of preparation that um, goes into uh, holding these meetings, doing all of this work and, and again, helping me uh, keep these meetings running. And, um, you know, I've been lucky to be on the commission. I've been on the commission for six years now. Um, and uh, I've been lucky to be on this commission during the, the self-help years. So, um, you know, that has come with a lot of opportunities and, and some challenges. It's been a wild ride of a year. Um, uh, some real contentious, uh, you know, issues and, and debates. Um, they've remained substantive, not personal. And I want to thank uh, Commissioner McPherson and Rockin for raising that. Um, it's it's even in the the difficult conversations. It's been a pleasure to work with you all, um, and um, I'm looking forward to continuing. Uh, so I will leave it there, and we'll uh, go ahead and. Who wants to speak? Oh. We have a, oh, we have a, a member of the public. Thank you, I didn't, my computer was blocking. Um, I do see a member of the public uh, who wishes to speak on the item. Uh, Brian from Trail Now. You're yeah, hey, thank, thank, thank you for taking the time to allow me to make a comment. So first of all, Chairman Brown, um, you know, I attend these meetings and I think you've done a phenomenal job. And, um, you know, over the last, while you uh, led this organization, um, it hasn't been as controversial as the past. I don't know if it's the subject or what, but you've done a very good job in managing uh, the, the communication. So I just want to commend you for that and thank you. Uh, my only other comment, what I think is pretty interesting, is I think the next generation is coming. Um, 
I think uh, our new chair and our vice chair are, are they the the Y generation? So I'm an I'm a right at the cusp of a baby boomer. I just find it very exciting that we're going to have the young leading us. Uh, I, I I won't say well. So the point is, I just find it interesting, and I'm really looking forward to their leadership. So again, Chairman Brown, thank you for your your uh, exceptional work. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples, and thank you for reminding me that Gen X too is uh, the older generation, one of the older generations. <laughs> um, I see another hand up, so I'll, I'll call in Michael Saint. Uh, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, I had my hand up for the previous agenda item. Are we? Is it okay to comment on that on the commissioners uh, that are exiting? Uh, sure, go go ahead. We'll, we're we're doing well here, so um, if you could quickly do that, okay. that'd be great. Thanks. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. I came to the meeting just specifically to uh, thank the outgoing commissioners for their public service. Uh, I especially wanted to emphasize uh, Jock Bertrand. Uh, we came into the public light a little bit at a similar time. I started my advocacy about six or seven years ago. And over that period of time, I did. And over that period of time, Jock and I, I think, became somewhat of friends. Uh, we had several phone conversations over all these items, as well as coffee, uh, different places in Capitola and Aptos. And uh, I truly respect uh, Jock a lot, and I think a lot of the elected officials, the appointees, can learn a lot from uh, Commissioner Bertrand because he was a true public representative. Uh, Chuck and I did not agree on a lot of things and uh, that did not matter. But what it did, I feel, he learned some stuff from me, I learned some stuff from him on a political aspect, as well as the corridor, the highway, et cetera. The thing that bothers me most about some of the electeds, I'm not gonna say any names, but I request meetings or try to get together. And a lot of times I don't even get a response from a lot of the people on this commission, uh, as well as my own district representative. Um, so you can learn a lot from Jock. He doesn't really care what your goals are or what you support, but he feels the public, he's a public representative and he comes and he will speak to anyone at any time. And uh, I wish you all the best Jock. I'm sure I'll talk to you soon. And uh, thanks for all your service. Thank you very much. Thank you. You cannot start your video. There are no the other rules. hands up. Thank Stop you. <laughs> okay, our next item is the director's report. The vote on the. Oh, I'm sorry. We had a motion and then all kinds of wonderful conversation. I forgot. Um, so we'll go ahead and um, call for a vote on the motion to appoint uh, Commissioner Koenig as chair for 2023 and. Commissioner Kristen Brown as vice chair. Commissioner Bertrand. Can I make a comment? Go for one quick comment. Or yes. it, okay, we're, we're approaching the vote. I, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about Kristen. Uh, I, as a city councilman is sharing with Kristen, she will be a great vice chair and a chair. We love her way of running the meetings in Capitola and the way she keeps the issues focused and I think this is something that will be very beneficial for any commission that she in the future is on also. Thank you. Thank you. And now a roll call. Sure thing. Commissioner Bertrand. I agree. Uh, Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Hurst. Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson. Aye. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Parker? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. Uh, Commissioner Rotkin? Mike, you're muted. Might be frozen. Oh, there, no, there he is. It looks like. Aye. Okay, there we go. Thanks. That passes unanimously. Congratulations. Right. Moving on to item 18. Yes. Uh, item 18 is our director's report. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for your service. I really um, have appreciated working with you. Um, your dedication towards the public process is um, um, outstanding. Um, you really do care about making sure that the community gets an opportunity to, to be part of the process and you never um, miss um, uh, letting them and, and, and appreciating the input that they can provide. And, you know, with that, said, um, you know, I can work with all of the commissioners, um, regardless of um, how you may feel about any particular issue. I, um, I can work with all of you because I can learn from all of you. And if people kind of consider that as we go through, um, you know, deciding difficult issues, um, it becomes so much easier to, to come to an agreement and, and find a way and a path forward. So thank you for all of the services by the commissioners that are outgoing. I only have a couple of announcements today um, for my director's report. Um, my first announcement is um, our current recruitment for the Measure D Taxpayers Oversight Committee for representatives from supervisory districts one and two. Uh, this independent oversight committee reviews the annual independent fiscal audits and the expenditures of Measure D revenues and issues an annual report on its findings regarding compliance with the requirements of the expenditure plan and ordinance. It's a very important role. It's a very technical role. Um, it's a very tedious role and the, the service of these uh, community members um, um, is very important for our mission. Um, members of this committee must be residents of Santa Cruz County who are neither elected officials of any government nor employees from any agency or organization that either oversees or implements projects funded from the proceeds of the sales tax. The committee will be made up of community members that fairly represent the geographical, social, cultural, and economic diversity of Santa Cruz County to ensure maximum benefit for our transportation users and shall include at least one person with an accounting or fiscal management background. The deadline for applications is January 3rd, 2022. Applications can be downloaded from the RTC website. <clears throat> My second announcement is that RTC will be hosting a celebration of our 50th anniversary next week on Thursday, December 8th at our office at 1101 Pacific Avenue, Suite 250. Um, the entrance to our building is off a lot four, um, where the farmer's market takes place. It's the back of the building. It's not off of Pacific Avenue. It's over by the um, mattress store. Uh, the event is taking place in an open house format with informational booths and displays set up with staff available from 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. You're welcome to come for our, uh, just a portion of the event. Um, we wanted to have it for a long period of time to make it as accessible as possible. The event will not have a formal presentation or speeches, but will be a festive opportunity for the public staff and commissioners to meet and celebrate 50 years of RTC planning and delivery of vibrant, sustainable, and equitable transportation solutions for Santa Cruz County. Although RTC staff considered calling a special meeting of the RTC to ensure brownout compliance, the statute does allow for purely ceremonial functions, provided the commissioners do not discuss amongst themselves future business within the subject matter jurisdiction of the RTC. So Chair Brown and I discussed the logistics of having a five hour long RTC meeting um, and decided that it would be permissible and desirable to not call a special meeting. So the 50th anniversary celebration is in fact a ceremonial event. Commissioners in attendance should be careful not to engage in any conversation with other commissioners that relate to RTC's future business decisions. You should strive to limit discussions to completed accomplishments, actions and programs of the RTC rather than prospective items. We will have plenty of time to discuss future business at publicly noticed RTC meetings such as today. This concludes my director's report and I hand it back to you, Chair Brown, for those important discussions and decisions. Thank you. All right. I do want to ask because occasionally there are members of the public who have a comment on the director's report. And I just want to make sure that we don't have anybody online. Okay. Uh, so. Seeing none, we will move on to 
uh, the Caltrans report. We'll turn it back to Tim Gubbins for your last report to us. All right. Thank, thank you, Chair Brown. I don't have very much today, but um, kind of going off what Commissioner Hernandez had brought up as far as safety, especially for vulnerable users of, of the transportation system. I wanted to point out FHWA has recently announced they have a new national roadway safety strategy and that help all the states address roadway safety across the nation. And as part of that to the states, including California, will complete a vulnerable road user safety assessment kind of using a new safety approach, a little different than we've done before. And, you know, we ident will identify areas of high risk, you know, and use some of the demographics and different performance related data, you know, in, in, in um, consultation with local government too. We'll help identify those safety areas that may not be the same way we've done it in the past. And as part of that, the US DOT has also adopted a safe systems approach, which again, in some ways changes the way we think about safe roadway safety. And recently, earlier this year, Caltrans had also adopted that approach. And when I say safe systems approach, it just, rather than look at all of the um, serious crashes just with that kind of data, we also have some principles that we include. Um, they include things like humans make mistakes. You know, humans are vulnerable. Responsibility is shared by roadway owners, the vehicle manufacturers, researchers, the roadway users, among, among many others. And so the focus is going to be on proactive safety and putting out redundancy where we where we do have it needed. And so um, this is a little bit different approach than we've done in the past. And I look, I, I think this is going to be a great way to help look at those those places that we do have our most vulnerable users because the people on foot and on bike have been experiencing very, very high safety related things. And we want to focus on them as well as making the roadway safer for all the uh, vehicular traffic as well. And on a related note, um, Altrans has been coordinating with CHP on some safety campaigns, including impaired, impaired driving, um, you know, the drowsy driving and distracted driving. Um, speeding and aggressive driving has really increased during the pandemic and we're trying to make sure that that goes away. And uh, for each of these efforts, we're having a specific public information component. Um, so you'll see more messages on our changeable message sign, as well as increased enforcement. Um, there's all sorts of uh, possible funds coming out through the Office of Traffic Safety. We'll be co coordinating and leveraging where we can. So in addition to that, um, we do have the normal um, Caltrans, Caltrans project update list that I believe uh, Commissioner McPherson referenced a little earlier. And that is all I have to share today, unless there are any questions. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, uh, thank you again, Mr. Gubbins. Uh, but uh, you, are you coordinating this effort? Uh, I'm sure you are with the California Highway Patrol or local police agencies, or how, how is that? You're, you're initiating it, but are you coordinating that effort? Yeah, we're we're coordinating very closely with CHP, especially. But in some areas, we do have local law enforcement too. Um, the the campaigns are mostly with CHP. Commissioner Caput. Yeah, you uh, you can hear me. Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, okay, the video. Uh, my video is not working. I. It says uh, host. Uh, okay, there we go. Let me start it. Uh, uh, okay, <laughs> there we go. Uh, thanks for your report. Uh, I guess on Houlihan and Highway 152, uh, they started the project and they were uh, going ahead a couple months ago and then they stopped. I guess there was a problem with. Uh, um, uh, one of the property owners uh, sold the property there and then uh, they didn't want uh, trucks and uh, uh, different vehicles uh, parked on their property. Is that, is that up to date now? Um, I believe so, but we have just been kind of partnering with that, with that county project. I'll have to check with my staff and county staff may sure. actually be a little bit more um, directly involved. Yeah, that would be great. Uh, they started okay. on it and uh, 
then they had to stop because of the uh, the purchase by the new owner uh, was complaining about something. Okay, thank you. Uh, Missioner Hurst. I want to take uh, the opportunity to thank uh, Caltrans uh, Director Gummins for uh, the, the attention that he's uh, focused on uh, Highway 152, 129, and Highway 1 through uh, the city of Watsonville. You know, we've had uh, a lot of safety issues in the community uh, regarding uh, roadway uh, tragedies, deaths, injuries, and such. And I, too, uh, attended the uh, remembrance ceremony with um, uh, Commissioner uh, uh, Alternate Hernandez. And, you know, it, it, it's an opportunity to reflect upon what could be uh, engineering-wise as well as driver and pedestrian uh, education safety for everybody's uh, best interest. And so I want to thank Caltrans for their partnership moving uh, safety forward, uh, moving transportation issues forward in their interest in design as well as uh, in not just the uh, efficiency of moving uh, uh, traffic uh, and, and congestion forward, but also keeping that sa focus on safety as well. So thank you, sir. Good luck. Thank you. Commissioner Hernandez. I also want to thank Mr. Gomez for all this hard work, uh, especially here in South County with high, Highway 1, uh, 129, and 152, specifically with the Interlaken uh, intersection and our downtown corridor. You know, our downtown um, is technically a highway, and, you know, we definitely, you know, been working on making the bike and pedestrian improvements there. But we have had uh, a number of issues there with uh, bike and pedestrian, um, both uh, collisions and fatalities actually. And so I wanna thank him for all the work that we've been uh, doing there. And uh, you know, it's it's uh, something that's critically needed in our downtown, of course, um, to, to protect lives. And you know, it really protects everyone because um, even the drivers are affected by all these incidents that happen, collisions that happen uh, for their lifetime, you know? And so uh, thank you for all the work that you've been doing here in South County. Um, and, you know, I look forward to the completion of our downtown as well. Uh, if there's any ch any way that we can get any of this uh, new information out from the FHWA, uh, the new new vulnerable uh, road user safety test and, you know, the new sis uh, safe systems approach, if you can email us any of that information, uh, I'd be uh, glad to share it with folks as well. Um, thank you. Thank you again. All right. Certainly, we will do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gubbins. We'll now move on to uh, item 20. This item is a contract award for professional engineering and environmental services and an amendment to the Measure D rail category five-year program of projects uh, for electric passenger rail transit and the trail project between the Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz along the Santa Cruz branch rail line. And I will turn it over to Sarah Christensen, uh, Senior Transportation Engineer for a report. Thank you, Chair Brown. So today I am here to recommend awarding a contract to HDR um, for this important project, uh, electric passenger rail transit and coastal rail trail along the Santa Cruz branch rail line. No, I'm good. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so um, this is an exciting time. We're advancing this project past the planning phase. Um, in August, uh, this commission directed staff to release an RFP. We did so. We received two proposals. Uh, the selection committee, uh, who consisted of RTC staff, uh, Santa Cruz Metro staff, and Caltrans Division of Rail and Mass Transportation, uh, selected HDR as the most qualified firm. 
And uh, we have been negotiating the contract since and are ready to uh, recommend awarding the contract to HDR today. Um, this is not, oh, there we go. So staff recommendation, we have a few items here. We are uh, requesting authorization to enter into a professional engineering and environmental services contract uh, with HDR for a total amount not to exceed $3 million to begin preparing the project concept report, which is task one in the scope of work. Uh, we also recommend amending the uh, Measure D rail category five-year program of projects to add additional funding through fiscal year 24 to partially fund the consultant contract um, through task one, amend the budget accordingly and authorize inter-program loans from other Measure D fund categories to the Measure D rail category if that is necessary. Sarah, your slideshow went backwards there. You're, you're not showing the current slide. I think you just click that resume slideshow box that's popped up. See if that works. On Zoom, what can you see? We see the, the slide one. Now we see slide two. Okay, let's try this. Rachel, can you please advance the slide? <laughs> I could just give an oral presentation. The PowerPoint is, uh, you won't, it's not much to miss, so. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine, I, I just want you to know that what was happening there. Thank you. <clears throat> So if you feel comfortable with that, um, Sarah, maybe we can just go ahead. I know we have um, materials in our packet that probably we can refer to for visuals okay. if needed. Although we may just give it one more try here. Okay, I'm just gonna go ahead here. Um, so project description, uh, this project is along the Santa Cruz branch rail line between Pajaro Junction and um, Natural Bridges Drive in the city of Santa Cruz, a total of 22 miles. It um, consists of converting the single track freight railroad to an electric passenger rail transit facility, which includes new passing siding stations, operations and maintenance and storage facilities. Uh, this will require replacement of uh, replacement or rehabilitation of major infrastructure, including bridges, culvert, track, and signals, adjustments to horizontal and vertical alignment of the track, and connection to the future Pajaro station. And that is all the electric passenger rail part of the project. Now I'm going to talk about the coastal rail trail. As you know, we have many segments under uh, development. Already, so this project um, includes the remaining segments that um, have not began development. So the scope of work includes uh, between Rio del Mar all the way to Pajaro Junction, um, and then the gap closure uh, that will remain, um, we're calling it segment 11 phase two, which is the Capitola trestle um, connection there. The scope of work for the contract that we are um, recommending awarding today is for the project concept report. That is task one in the scope of work that uh, was included in the RFP. Um, the remaining tasks uh, will be preliminary engineering. Um, task three is initial right-of-way services and task four is the draft and final environmental documentation. Um, we expect um, the project concept report to be an important first step in these um, in the project to um, develop a stable project definition for the remaining um, subsequent tasks that you see. Can you all see now the PowerPoint? Yes, we're on, yes, yeah. we're on your page. 
great. And then the RFP, just a side note, included full service engineering all the way through um, construction of the project. Okay, next. So the first 12 months of task one is what we are um, proposing to proceed with. Uh, the following bullet points is what we believe will be included in that first year of work. Uh, there's gonna be a extensive community and stakeholder outreach throughout the entire process of development of the initial purpose and need statement for the project, initial ridership and operating model work, um, a environmental uh, existing conditions initial screening, structures existing conditions assessment, um, development of the project alignment for both the rail facility and the trail segments, uh, crossing investigation, uh, that's the grade crossings. Uh, we have many of them on the branch line. Uh, an initial right-of-way investigation, which will um, include a focused boundary survey and project management through the whole process. Next slide. The funding strategy uh, that we came up with for this project includes uh, getting started with local funds. Um, as you know, uh, there's insufficient pay-as-you-go capacity in the Measure D rail category to fund all of task one through um, the duration of task one. So staff is recommending getting started um, to program 3.8 million total to complete the first 12 months of task one. And concurrent with that, we are um, actively pursuing competitive grants. The funds will serve as a local match for those competitive grants. The grant that we are currently preparing an application for is the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program or TERSIP. They have a special project development set aside fund of $150 million uh, that we are pursuing um, to fully fund tasks one through four of this um, project. Next. So the fiscal impacts of this uh, item, uh, the insufficient capacity and measure D rail category to fund all of task one through the duration of task one, um, our solution for that is to uh, propose getting started awarding the cost plus fixed fee contract with a not to exceed value of $3 million to cover the first 12 months. And then um, another solution to that is actively pursuing the grants to fully fund the work. And we anticipate um, the awards for TERSUP to be announced in the spring or summer timeframe of 2023. So that's before the 12 months are up. Next slide. And then finally, um, we touched on this quite a bit in the staff report, but we have uh, 4.7 million in outstanding invoices to um, Cal OES, California Office of Emergency Services and the Federal Emergency Management Agency, Cal OES and FEMA. Uh, this was disaster relief funding uh, for work that we completed earlier this year. Um, and that was due to the 2017 storms. We are continuing to pursue full reimbursement from um, Cal OES and FEMA. And this is why we are recommending um, because of the uncertainty of when those funds are gonna um, be reimbursed. Uh, the Measure D rail category may need to pay back the loan from the Regional Service Transportation Program Exchange. And this may require inter-program loans from other Measure D categories. And with that, uh, that concludes my staff report. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. I will now look to my colleagues for questions, comments, uh, Commissioner Bertrand and then Commissioner McPherson. Um, thank you very much for that report. Um, I welcome the initiative here. Here's some funding costs, definitely. Um, one thing that's come up and I know um, Mr. Monning's been involved in this. Um, I don't know, due to oversight or what, I, I don't think it's important at this point, but uh, it's a lot of private property boundary issues. And the one that I think we've been involved in to some extent is uh, mobile home issues where mobiles are over the line. And this represents a significant um, problem for them. Obviously, people that 
um, have in many cases, people that I know in capital spent considerable amount of their life savings to, to buy into the park. And it's clear that the responsibility could lie on the RTC side, could lie on the property owner, the park owner. I don't know. But there's other issues I think we're all aware of. And so I just want to mention that right now because I think the RTC does share that responsibility. And so I want to, for the public record, I don't know how this issue or these issues are going to be resolved, but I just want to make that statement. And um, for the future commissioners, we do need to think very clearly about the fact that there's people's lives, there's people's homes, there's people's properties, in many cases that they've saved many years just to purchase. So um, to executive director, I, I, I know that uh, you have concerns about other people and, and how they are in their lives. And I just want to put that out. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, thank you for that report. And it's, I think it's good that we're at this point, finally. Um, with the increase uh, of funding from Measure D's rail pot, uh, that's going to go to this, the total of three, up to $3 million. Can you describe what projects uh, or maintenance will not be funded because of the need for more money uh, for this contract? I mean, in particular, local roads or um, pedestrian special needs, um, metro, so forth. You know, how much is going to be taken from them? And I, I don't want to get this conflict. I just want to know uh, what, what amount we are loaning from them, if you will. So I, I can try to answer that question. Um, <clears throat> the rail category funding will ultimately be responsible for all of the costs for the rail portion of this project. The trail um, pot will be responsible for all of the costs associated with the trail portion of this project. We have a mechanism that allows us to loan money from one category to another. That loan needs to be paid back and it needs to be paid back with interest. That's part of our strategic implementation plan and it is um, allowable per the ordinance. One of the things that the Taxpayer Oversight Committee has frequently brought up with us is that we're accumulating cash balances in several of these accounts. And they've mentioned what can we do to try to get that money out there. We, we state all the time that we have all of these transportation problems, but yet they look at our financials and they see that there's money you know, still available in several of the accounts. Um, the account most likely to loan money to this effort, if needed, and it may not be needed at all, um, would be the highway category, as the highway category um, obtains the highest uh, percentage of regional funds. Um, and most of those projects are still in development and have not gone to construction yet. And when we did get construction funding for the ones that are about to start. It's mainly funded from grant programs. That's going to change in about 2024. So we have some time. Um, if we need to uh, loan the money temporarily, it will be paid back with interest. So there really will be no ultimate impact on any of these accounts. We monitor this very closely and try to maximize the amount of money that is out there on the street delivering transportation improvements. So it really should never have any impact on any of the other programs. Um, it will impact our ability to do preservation on the rail line um, by spending on this category, but only during the period that we're spending money on this specific effort. Um, this is a 30 year program. Um, we anticipate bringing in about a billion dollars total in Measure D money over the lifetime of the project. The 8% rail category is about 80 million. So this 4 million is only about 5% of the total of the funding that would be brought in overall uh, for, the, for this category. So we have a pretty good handle on how to make sure we can maximize getting uh, work done without impacting any one category over the other. Thank you for that clarification. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commissioner Caput. Uh, thank you. Your turn. <clears throat> you bet. Thank you. Uh, Guy, uh, Preston, thank you very much uh, for clarifying uh, the uh, uh, 
Supervisor McPherson's question. Uh, the 4.7 million is the key to uh, a lot of paying back everything, right? Is that correct? So that would affect our cash flow uh, significantly. Um, if FEMA reimburses us all $4.7 million, um, the rail category will be on a much better footing than if they were not to. But either way, we have a mechanism to uh, mitigate those concerns and keep the project moving. Okay, and then what, what is the interest being charged on the loan? Generally, if we do an inter-program loan, we look at what the county pool is currently um, um, receiving for money that is deposited and earning interest, and we use that same interest rate. So there's a net zero effect to the program that is um, providing the loan. An example of an inter-program loan that has already taken place and authorized by this commission was the loan for the wildlife crossing project to start. Uh, that project um, receives $5 million over the life of the program. Um, at the time that the loan was taken, uh, the interest rates were down in the you know low 1% to 2%. And I believe that's the interest rate uh, that we use to, that we're using to pay back that loan. So there, it, there's no net effect um, on that money not being invested um, in um, the, the pool, it's paid back at the same interest rate um, that it would receive in the pool by the category that is receiving the funding temporarily. Okay, and finally, uh, thanks, Guy. And finally, uh, uh, the word if, if we get paid back the 4.7 million, uh, what's the, <laughs> if we had a uh, percentage of, uh, we're not getting back the money, or uh, would you say it's a 50-50 chance, or it's 90% uh, that we should get it, uh, the 4.7 million, or uh, the word if is uh, what stands out there? I anticipate that we will definitely receive at least some of the funding from them. So a 100% chance that we'll receive or 99% chance that we'll receive some of the funding. FEMA often looks at what you did out there versus what was needed to restore the line for service. So they may look at some of the improvements that we've done as a betterment. And if they do, there's a possibility that they may say, well, I can see paying you for this aspect of the work, but some of the additional work you did um, was a betterment um, in excess of what was needed to restore the line back to its original state of service. So I'd say there's a higher probability that we will receive um, some sort of uh, reduction um, from FEMA in the amount that they allow, but we are going to fight for every penny. You bet, thanks, thank you. Commissioner uh, Quinn. Oh, thank you, Chair. And uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Christensen, for uh, the attachment for number for item 20. It's very comprehensive. You know, as I read through it, and I recognize that Measure D made it clear that the public does want rail included in future planning, it, it reads a little bit like a wish list. And, and I, I guess I'm a little concerned that we, I mean, I'm obviously voted that we continue to explore rail and I uh, endorse the exploration, but the risk category mentioned in the outline seems pretty lightly weighted in the deliverables. And I'm just worried that we're pursuing rail quote at any cost. How do we factor in the discovery of risk and cost associated with the rail to temper the expectations that we can deliver rail quote at any cost? Thank you, um, Commissioner Quinn. So. Uh, the, I guess the approach that we, that staff is proposing to take is to identify those delivery risks to the project early, um, and study them and, uh, bring the information forward and, um, do the heavy lifting early. Uh, and that is sound project delivery. <laughs> And it usually results in, um, you know, obviously having a lot more time um, and understanding of those risks to solve those problems. Um, and so 
I would say um, the scope of work for the project concept report is somewhat robust. It's more, I think it's actually more than what we originally planned because as we thought through the scope of work and what we actually need and the information that the public seeks and the information that this commission seeks, we beefed up task one a bit and we brought some of those um, some of those deeper dives into these project risks forward into task one for that reason. And, so hopefully and, I and I apologize for the broadness of the question, but you know, as Mr. Bertrand said earlier, mm -hmm. choosing to spend your money on one item often precludes spending it on another. And and as we work through this and inform the commission and the public, will we have mileposts where we decide or we determine in a collaborative way that the cost, and again, I'm thinking back to the Capitola trestle alone, the cost is making the project, um, at least how will we address the cost and what will be the burden both on the people paying the fare and on the taxpayers to make this project work? Right, so currently the funding is the Measure D rail category funds. So that expenditure plan um, includes preservation of the branch line, um, as well as analysis, such as what we're proceeding with, the project concept report, tasks one through four of the scope of work. Um, so in other words, we're not, I guess, proposing to take money away from any other local projects or projects of other types for this particular study. And then we are pursuing um, state and federal competitive grants to fully fund the project. So that should not, quote, take away from other projects. Um, and then, you know, just looking forward, once SEQ was complete, the project's not over yet. We will be continuing to pursue um, grants for other um, future phases, such as construction. So going through this process, completing tasks one through four, we should have um, a well-developed cost estimate. And uh, that will allow us to make decisions and strategize on how to fully fund this project. Um, and then also part of the work is um, identifying that we do need a, an additional funding source for the operation and maintenance of this facility. And so that is definitely um, anticipated. And so um, we just, we don't have enough information right now to bring more information about that because the size of it, the timing of it, um, but we do recognize there will be another funding source needed. Thank you. And if, and if I can elaborate a little bit too, um, risk is a very important aspect of any project and project delivery. If you remember my um, interview for this job, that was one of the three biggest challenges I think I brought up. That was one of the questions you asked me. And what did you think? the three biggest challenges were and how would I manage them? And I talked about risk and risk register. Um, task 1.16 of our scope of work is the conceptual um, initial risk analysis and risk register. Um, we're taking the more complicated version of this um, where you really do um, look at the risk and um, uh, the probability of the events occurring with the schedule and cost impacts. So we use a level three risk register and that's what you usually use for complex projects. Um, we've also decided that to manage risk, having a, and, and Sarah's already mentioned this, but I'm gonna emphasize it. Um, we're, we're doing a very comprehensive um, concept report before we really kick off the environmental document. And we're doing significant engineering early so we can identify these areas and fully uh, inform the commission and the public of the um, probability of these risks, um, the impacts of the risk and our management strategy. So throughout this process, we will be bringing and identifying it. These are not easy problems. Um, you know, one of them, uh, Commissioner Bertrand has already brought up. Uh, we're going to have to manage that risk. We're going to have to have some difficult conversations with the community and the public to understand the trade-offs between the benefits of a, a very um, a, a transformative project like this with the impacts because there's going to be a combination of both. 
Thank you. Commissioner Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, as I want to do every once in a while, I will check my email and look for comments from the public. And a lot of those comments this time were about failures, really, of uh, diff excuse me, different rail project systems that are going on throughout our state. So this question is for maybe Sarah, but also for Guy, um, in that do we ever, you know, have an honest conversation? I mean, you just referred to the fact that we're going to have a difficult conversation with the public and with uh, commissioners and so forth. Do you ever go to other agencies uh, such as, you know, Smart Train or San Jose Light Rail people or High Speed Rail people or BART? I mean, I just saw a headline from the San Francisco Chronicle, a death spiral BART scenario includes cutting weekend service. Um, if I look at the light rail issue over uh, with the VTA in San Jose, the Mercury News says, as it approaches the point of needing to order replacement for light rail vehicle fleet, the transit agency serving San Jose area is considering a more existential question, whether its light rail system even has a future. Now that's the board talking about its system. So I appreciate the fact that Sarah Christensen, when you say this is an exciting time, but why is it exciting? Um, what is the future of rail? I mean, can anybody honestly say this is a vibrant, expanding, exciting uh, sort of uh, future? I mean, I, I'm looking for I'm looking for results. Okay, and I'll say it again: those who ignore history are kind of condemned to repeat it. So my question to um, Mr. Preston is. Do you ever have conversations, maybe even back channel conversations with people at these different agencies that says, not the ones that give the publicity reports, but the ones that say, man, we're in trouble here, okay? If we had to do it over again, would we really do it? So those are the kinds of difficult conversations I want to have, that I want our executive director to have, that we have honest conversations about what works and what doesn't before you start throwing in 3 million and then 10 million and 20 million and you know a million a, a billion here and a billion there pretty soon you're talking about real money if you know if to quote Everett Dirksen I believe so um that's kind of you know I just don't see a bright future for rail but apparently other people do show me why okay before we start spending incrementally over here over here, over here, that something is something in, ter in terms of becoming a death spiral, okay? Is the future really re re really real? Uh, you know, earlier we had a speaker from the public talking about, what was it, Railcat? Um, people are looking into things like that. You know, being open to other alternatives instead of something that, you know, I'm seeing, and even Metro, right? Our own Metro is having problem putting behinds in the seats, right? I just went to, you know, Scotts Valley has a metro, uh, uh, essentially, parking lot. Um, I visited there four times this week and counted the cars. An average, and now I don't know what the capacity is of that parking lot. It's hundreds, but there was an average of 30 cars per day. Okay. Public public transportation, is it viable, is it working? Or are, are people cutting back on it, okay? Or are they actually using it? Is there a transformational situation with COVID where people are just working from their homes and it's never really gonna be the same again? Okay, those are the type of tough questions I wanna ask before we start spending 3 million here, 5 million here, 10 million there, depending on grants, interagency, loans, and so forth. So. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Johnson. Commissioner Schifrin. Yes, thank you. Uh, I wanna thank the staff for the report. I think it was helpful. I did have questions. I wanna thank uh, the director for responding. Uh, the comment from the last commissioner's speech about uh, 
ignoring history makes you repeat it, I would just remind us all about Measure D. Um, Measure D sent a pretty strong message, I think, my interpretation, that people didn't want to rip out the rail line and they wanted to look at whether in fact rail is feasible. And I think that's in Santa Cruz. Uh, I'm always skeptical about applying uh, situations elsewhere to uh, our community because the devil, as you know, is in the details. And the details here are not the same as they may be up in Sonoma County. I don't know whether ultimately it will be possible to have a feasible passenger rail system um, between Santa Cruz and Watsonville, but I think we need to look at it. I think this contract moves us along the way. I think what that's what the vote of Measure D uh, told us we wanted to do. And I think the commission has been very supportive of that direction thus far. Um, obviously, there are skeptics uh, and there are reasons to be skeptical because there's a lot uh, that's unknown. Uh, this is, is an expensive uh, effort. I wish it wasn't so expensive, but I don't, I, I, you know, um, I think it's impressive that our staff is wanting to look at it in a very detailed, um, comprehensive way so that ultimately the commission will be able, assuming we can get the funding to actually carry the study through to conclusion, to be able to make uh, an, uh, a decision based on information, uh, not other, not people's predictions about what they think the future is going to be like or what it's like someplace else, but what, uh, what would it take uh, to, to have a, a, a passenger rail service that would be operating in Santa Cruz County. So, um, you know, I don't really have a question. I'm sort of, uh, I know this is a time for questions, but since others made comments, I want to make comments as well. I am supportive of uh, the staff recommendation on this item. Uh, Commissioner Bertrand. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, not to rebuff you, Andy. Um, I'm not sure what Measure D, the most recent Measure D, actually said about um, the will of Santa Cruz residents. Uh, There's so many causes for why they voted one way or the other. I think it's fair to say that most people who really think about the issues would agree. Maybe that's an assumption, but that's my comment because that's the feedback I get. Um, I'm very supportive of this measure, really, of this proposal, excuse me. And the reason why is because I think it is the best effort that we have at this point, if the commission approves to get a clear idea what the costs are. I approve, excuse me, I am very glad that it's detailed. I'm uh, risk analysis is very critical because we don't know what the future is. I, th I think staff has come through, thank you Guy, to lead this effort and everyone's there. That this is what we need because there's so many arguments in our community what the cost is. And we need this kind of report so that we have the data to actually allow people to make a decision. Because ultimately the decision, whether we're gonna go ahead is gonna be based on what the people in Santa Cruz County are willing to vote for. And like I said earlier, spending money on this train and this trail is gonna take away from money that we could be using for other things in this county. And so that's gonna be part of the discussion, maybe five years from now, maybe 10 years from, I have no clue, but that's why I particularly like this study. Thank you very much. Chair. Um, I, so I just wanna get Commissioner Cap, it does have a hand up and then I'll um, get, get back to you. Um, Commissioner Caput, go for it. And then Commissioner Koenig. You're on mute, Greg. Greg, you're on mute. We can't hear you. There we go. Okay. Uh, yeah, all the comments are, uh, are fine. I think Measure D made it very clear uh, in the last uh, vote back in June that uh, the people do want to have rail between uh, Santa Cruz and Watsonville and and beyond. So I, I think 
Uh, our small section of all of this about the risk and everything is all uh, correct. I believe there is risk in anything. But I just wanted to make it clear that uh, the people of Santa Cruz actually did say they want to go forward. And uh, that's what I want to see happen also. Uh, Davenport to Watsonville, Pajaral, and uh, maybe connecting to uh, Gilroy and also Monterey and uh, the rest of the state. This, we're a small section and a small part of a big idea for the whole state. And uh, at one time we had a governor, uh, Brown, that wanted to have rail everywhere, basically. but. Uh, yeah, uh, priorities shift, and uh, but I, I just want to make it clear that uh, people of Santa Cruz County made it absolutely clear that they want to go forward with uh, rail also, uh, part of the transportation. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. Um, since we're uh, pining ab about the meaning of Measure D, I mean, I think it, it is difficult to uh, to determine exactly what voters meant with that. Um, I, you know, personally believe that uh, what we saw there was a lot of fear at work, fear of loss, which, as we know, uh, is actually one of the most powerful human motivators. And so there was fear about potentially losing the beach train, fear about losing an, an option for transit. Um, and so I think that's why voters ultimately voted no on Measure D. But I think if you start talking about uh, taking people's money away, uh, whether it's with a new sales tax measure or even uh, spending money that could be used um, for for other things, um, you know, ultimately like alternative transit options on the corridor or uh, other infrastructure maintenance, that um, that's going to activate that same fear of loss. And we could see, see that uh, at play in future elections, future initiatives, uh, which are asking for more money for rail. Um, I mean, uh, at the same election, uh, June of this year, we also saw a sales tax measure in the city of Santa Cruz fail. So uh, sales tax measures are not particularly popular at the moment. Um, I want to get down to a few questions. So, I mean, we are talking about allocating $3 million now, but the total uh, budget here and for this project scope for this first phase one uh, is $7.759 million. So does that mean that probably within the next 12 months, we would, the commission would be asked to approve another 4.759 million? Yes. And with the grants that we're applying for the TERSIP, um, would any of that cover this initial phase or that would only be for later phases of the EIR? We are assuming it would cover the remainder of task one in addition to task two through four to fully fund through CEQA. So if we got TERSIP funding, it could pay for that four point, uh, the, the remainder after this 3 million, 4.5 million roughly Correct. of the phase one. Okay. Um, you know, in the, uh, to Commissioner Quinn's point of trying to get down to the, the media's questions that the greatest risk as soon as possible. Um, and I, I also appreciate that um, approach from staff in general, both in doing this conceptual report um, and, you know, as, as you expressed, uh, identifying some of those key questions. I mean, is there an opportunity to push that any further? Um, is, is there an opportunity to break up the, the project a little bit um, to, to here? I mean, you know, I noticed that the conceptual rail transit ridership and revenue forecast wasn't in the first year of, uh, you know, of work. Could we move that up? Um, same with prelim preliminary opinion of probable conceptual capital and operations and maintenance cost estimates. And those seem like, you know, ridership, is there, is there demand for this? Uh, and costs, those seem like pretty big risk factors. Could we look at those in the first year of work? So the, um, the work that we anticipate uh, the first year does include some ad initial modeling for ridership and um, development of that operating model. And the way that it works, it's somewhat of an iterative process from how I understand it is going to be happening is, um, you know, the model is developed and then the alignment um, comes in and then there's somewhat of an iterative back and forth um, between, you know, updating the model to see what certain tweaks in the alignment would do 
to ridership. So obviously if you have, I'll just give you an example of um, having really sharp curves in the alignment, you have to slow down, right? That's going to increase your travel time. That could affect ridership. So it's all kind of a holistic um, beast <laughs> that we have to, um, we have to start somewhere. So um, the first 12 months were, you know, putting together that initial model, and then we're going to um, do some kind of sensitive sensitivity tests to it based on all the other factors that are going to factor into that. Um, and then cost, um, I would love to have a cost estimate today, but uh, realistically, that's usually done somewhat towards the end of the engineering process, just because with all the, you know, the milestone steps and the outreach and um, development of the uh, alignment and the ridership modeling, um, we want to, we want to obviously get it right. And so it's best to not spin our wheels and try to estimate every single thing um, through the process. So those costs are going to, they're going to come later, but we can, you know, qualitatively tell you through the process if things are going to be more expensive. <laughs> um, so, but we won't necessarily be able to quantify them um, to the detail that we will at the end. So we had um, really interesting conversations with the um, selection committee about when to do the ridership analysis. Um, a lot of the consultants came in and, and, and had it as an early task. Um, it's interesting. I, I'm going to go to a question Andy Schifrin asked me um, before today's meeting regarding um, the past studies. And um, are we building off of those studies or are we just you know, starting all over again? Are we really making sure we we take advantage of the work that we've done thus far? Um, we are going to do that. Um, we have initial ridership numbers from our past studies. And as Sarah articulated, um, as we go through this iterative process, um, things are going to change. And there's a lot of work that goes into ridership. And to try to refine it to maybe see if it's going to bring in 10% more, 15% more and spend all that effort on it. Cause there's a lot of effort that goes into calculating ridership. Um, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense until you really have your project defined better. So we are going to do some initial work on it, but we're not going to overkill it early on. We're going to wait till we have a good definition of the project. And then we're going to do that work. We think it's a more efficient way of, ensuring we get the most most bang for our buck with respect to that. And, you know, there are a lot of um, locations that we've identified that are really risky um, in front of the boardwalk. I mean, that's uh, subject to sea level rise. We've got a congestion problem with the tracks going right down the middle of the, the roadway. We've got um, a, um, conflict with um, the beach train in that location. Um, and its ability to continue to serve the boardwalk while running a commuter train down through there. That's a location that we're going to do a lot of work with. It's going to require a lot of stakeholder engagement with the Seaside Company, with the City of Santa Cruz. What do they really envision this location looking like when this project is done? Uh, same is true for the bluffs above Manresa. Um, the comments that have been made by um, members of the public about not being able to get Coastal Commission approval. We need to flush that out. Um, we need to start meeting with the Coastal Commission early and talk to them about what they're going to require in terms of an alternatives analysis to ensure that we don't move forward with a project that's not buildable. Uh, same with the Harkin Slough area. I mean, that area I've walked on and it's been underwater um, now before uh, we've experienced 20 more years of sea level rise. Um, you know, what's the requirement there? Are we going to have to build a viaduct through there to elevate the, the rail line so that it doesn't flood? Uh, those are the areas we're going to um, drill down on early and then figure out what our solutions are and um, then do a cost estimate and have a good ridership analysis and a concept report and a cost estimate so that the commission knows, okay, now we're going to start environmental on this. And, um, you know, we've accepted that this is manageable risk and this is a permissible, permittable project and we'll see where we can go with it. 
Okay, I hear you that uh, some of those later phases of ridership calculation and costs uh, are dependent on these first parts of, of the study. Uh, and I'm glad to hear that you're going to engage in the coastal with the Coastal Commission early, um, given what we've seen in Southern California, uh, with you know them asking us uh, uh, other lines to move in. Uh, I don't know, forty, a hundred feet uh, or something inland. So um, that's great. Um, there's a couple more questions. So we've you know heard consistently from train supporters that um, they feel like we're kind of looking at the. Um, I don't know what d deluxe train here and uh, really we could do something better, faster, cheaper. Um, is this study kind of really dig into that a little bit so that, um, you know, if, as we do move forward, I mean, the goal of this study is really to provide data uh, and get us all working on the same page as a community to build consensus. And so I just want to make sure that it'll also address some of those core questions um, that I know rail supporters have of, of what the, what the most cost effective rail option is going to be. We definitely are going to have an extensive public engagement period. And we want to hear from the public about the different um, ideas that they have um, so that we don't move forward with a project that is not consistent with what the community and what the commission is, is really ultimately looking at. Um, you have to remember that when you start you know, changing the scope of the project, it could change the performance metrics. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a, a rail system that um, doesn't have sidings, you you have no where to pass. You can't have very frequent service. If you um, don't uh, address the alignment concerns, uh, and maybe you put in too many stations, you're not going to be able to have a travel time of 40 minutes between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Those are the sorts of things that we have to um, help the public understand um, when we um, talk about the project and kind of drill down on really what we want the project to be. You know, um, that, you know, it could change things. And that would, of course, then change the ridership and change the cost and all of those other um, aspects. One of the reasons why we had uh, the Caltrans Division of Rail and Mass Transit as part of our interview panel is because we're very much interested in them helping us to fund this project. And they very much want to see a project that is consistent with the state rail plan and that uh, creates interoperability. They really did not want us to choose between light rail and commuter rail as part of the TCAA because they want us to flesh this out and understand how this would work with respect to the state rail plan. That's very important in terms to our ability to attract funding, um, state funding and federal funding for um, um, our future construction and operations costs. So um, we're going to have to bring all of that forward so that people can understand, yeah, you may be able to do a cheaper system, but it may not be as attractive to the state to fund. And that may, in turn, not really make it less affordable for this county. Um, it may also affect ridership numbers. And, you know, that those are the things we're going to work on to try to um, help educate and um, um, receive the input that we need to develop the best project definition moving forward. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, my final question is, I guess, more towards the latter part of um, the environmental impact report. Um, you know, we heard, I mean, I mentioned that Contra Costa is looking into um, putting some automated vehicles on their streets, and we've heard from the public about that. Um, I mean, I'm curious if if we get to the end of this and find that, a, you know, transit plan A rail is not going to work, how do we, are we, providing any space for transit plan B whenever that would come along in the future? Um, or is that just a whole nother planning effort that we would have to look at in the future? I mean, with the environmental impact report, as we look at alternatives, is it going to be pretty much rail project or no project, or would there be other options considered? So we, um, spent the time to do an extensive transit corridor alternatives analysis to determine the best type of transit on the rail line. Um, we consider this a form of pre-scoping the project. 
those other alternatives were looked at as part of the TCAA. At this point, it's a rail project. It's either a rail or a no build. And this commission is ultimately the decision makers. And we're doing this in an iterative process with several tasks uh, and decision points along the way. If the commission wants to change direction, that's the prerogative of the commission and staff will uh, follow that direction. But at this point, um, we have uh, defined this project as a rail project moving forward on the rail line with the trail adjacent to it. Okay, thank you. I had um, one other response to Commissioner um, Johnson's uh, questions that I didn't get an opportunity to respond to. Um, I mean, Commissioner Johnson is correct in that that rail transit projects right now or rail rail um, operations right now are down. The ridership is down significantly. The article he referred to uh, about Bart looking at a a, a death spiral analysis. Uh, I read that article. Um, it, it was important information to understand. That was their worst case scenario. They looked at, okay, if and when we lose COVID funding, if ridership comes uh, doesn't come back, what are our options? And they looked at several things. That was only one of them. It made good headlines. So it was the headlines of the story. Um, of course, you know, the rail transit agencies are concerned about ridership. And um, they're looking to the state and lobbying to the, the state and federal government for additional operational funds. Um, I do not think the state and federal government have given up on rail. Um, the state just had a huge um, uh, budget surplus. And as part of that surplus, they augmented several programs, including the Transit and Inner City Rail Capital Program. That augmentation created this $150 million fund that we can apply for for project development. That didn't exist last cycle. It was not very easy to get funding for an environmental document. I'm not saying that it's going to be easy now, but we're going for it. Um, we have an opportunity and they have not given up on this. But there is concerns and one of the things that um, I heard was brought up uh, repeatedly at the self-help county coalition is um, how the state will not contribute as much for rail operations. And is there a way that possibly they can start doing so? Because there is still very much an impetus to move people away from personal vehicles and more towards public transit. Um, where fortunate that we're not, you know, starting a system right now, we're starting to analyze a potential system right now. What the landscape is going to look like in two years when we finish the concept report is going to be different than it is today. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell you exactly what it's going to be, but it's going to be different. And it's going to be different two years later when we hopefully finish the environmental impact report and have to start moving forward with an initial uh, you know, a funding plan to try to get to construction and operations. So you know, I, I do talk to these other agencies. I know the chief engineer at SMART. Um, they're very bullish still on their program. They're looking at a, a, an additional connection along State Route 36 to connect it to the Capitol Corridor. Um, there are um, uh, plans to continue to move forward with um, uh, additional improvements throughout the state, um, including Mark to San Jose Airport. Uh, the VTA light rail system is definitely something that I look at, and it concerns me when people talk about light rail on our rail line because it's slower. It's not, um, it, it did not um, attract the ridership that they were hoping for in San Jose. I've taken uh, VTA light rail. Um, from uh, the closest station I could get to, which was in Los Gatos, to uh, Mountain View to see the Pac-10 championship game. It took over an hour to get there. I decided it probably wasn't a very efficient system for me to use again. I don't want to make those mistakes here. And so that is, goes back to Commissioner Koenig's discussion about, you know, there are members of the public that look at this and say, are we 
doing too much? Are we trying to build too much? I don't know yet. We have to look at the performance metrics that people want to see to attract the ridership, to understand the land development issues, and build a system that would be useful and not detrimental to our community. Thank you for sharing those comments. Um, Commissioner Rotkin. Thank you. Um, Turn. I, I want to honor and respect the kind of skepticism of some of our members about whether in the end we're going to be able to build a system that works and that we can afford. Um, I, that's, uh, I don't share that same level of skepticism, but I, it's not inappropriate. It's not silly or um, wrong to have those views. And I appreciate that despite that skepticism, this commission did vote unanimously to move sort of forward, at least to the point that we're at right now, and hope that that people's willingness to at least consider um, in the face of their skepticism, um, supporting enough additional studies that allow us to have a really good idea of where it is we want to go and whether it's really feasible in the long run. I do want to really emphasize that this is an iterative process and that what we're being asked to support today basically is uh, we will be funded out of the portion that the voters gave us money for, for rail, the 8%. I mean, it involves some borrowing, but I think our staff's done a pretty good job of demonstrating that we're not taking great risk with other um, uh, projects within the Measure D uh, funding uh, structure. Um, and so I, the idea that, as Randy pointed out, I think, you know, appropriately, at some point it's not 3 million that we're talking about, it's 20 and it's 15 and 20 and big numbers and so forth. But that's not the decision that's in front of us today. Um, and I have to say, I, as somebody who uh, generally a strong supporter of rail, um, it's possible that I'm going to be persuaded at some point in this process not to spend that next $20 million or something that uh, that, that uh, Brett um, Garrett's uh, idea about an alternative system that they're trying in Contra Costa or something like it may make more sense. Um, but at this point, I think we owe it to the public to try and uh, sort of proceed with the process that we have now um, to, to make the expenditure that we're being asked to, to put to gather enough information to to test the skepticism. And again, as I say, I want to, I'm, I'm, this is not just a political ploy. I, the skepticism is not, is uh, warranted because we, it, even though in the rest of the world, rail seems to be what's happening and it's not like some dead technology of the past, the United States has not got a very great record about how we've sort of implemented rail uh, systems. Um, I do want to say about the one study that uh, Randy mentioned about the, the, the one about the, uh, uh, what's it called, the death spiral and stuff. If you read that article carefully, and Guy Preston talked about this a little bit, it, that's not a report about what's going on. That's a report about like what could happen badly if everything goes wrong and the whole thing falls to, into a complete mess. And when I was reading that article, I'm going like, what kind of a news story is this? This is kind of totally speculative and based on very little that's actually happening. And just to be clear, that's an article that says there's a death spiral, not just for rail, but for every form of public transit, including buses, Closing that, Bart's going to have to close down. That's what it concluded. Oh, if, things, if everything goes wrong and things are terrible, we'll have to close down Bart. We won't have any bus systems anymore. Everybody's going to go back to private automobiles. And I guess we're just then subject to moving three miles an hour on a highway waiting to get somewhere. So it, that's not a study that moved me particularly. I do think the problems that have been had by some of the other systems around the state are worth looking at. And those give me a little more pause and reason to, you know, sort of maintain at least my own sort of sense of skepticism about whether in the end this is all going to work. But as I say, I'm going to end with this comment. I, I think the public has given us money to at least study the feasibility of rail. We're not stealing it from other places in the in the Measure D expenditure model or other kinds of modes of transportation. Um, we're not being asked to make a commitment because you vote for this today. You're not being asked to commit that you're going to agree to spend 20 or 40 million dollars in the long run or whatever the 100 million dollar cost of the operation subsidy and everything else that happens here. Those are things that depend upon an iterative process that either will look make it look more promising at the end or less promising. And Everybody reserves their right at some point, myself included, to say, you know, yeah, I, let's let's study this thing. I really appreciate our staff presenting a plan for us that actually will get us the information we need. I think they've done a really good job of responding to what we asked for. And so I'm hoping people will vote for this at this stage and not feel, you know, as I said in another meeting, you, you reserve your, I told you so rights if this all comes to nothing in the end. I mean, that's that, that can happen. That's We don't know the future. So those are my comments. Thank you. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner Johnson. And then I, I would like to take it out to the public. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Commissioner McPherson. I'll, oh, yeah. So we'll get uh, Commissioner Johnson, Commissioner McPherson, and then I do want to go out to the public. Thanks. I'll try to be short here. So uh, I appreciate the comments um, with respect to, you know, wanting to explore, investigate, and so forth. Um, I also want to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, when information comes back, it's not like everybody is unanimous in terms of what the actual data show. Um, you know, I don't think public entities can be treated like a business. If, if, if we treated a government like a business, you know, three quarters of it, of it would sh shut down because there's no profit in it, right? But there are times when you have to do that. And so with respect to, you know, when we have an entity here in Scotts Valley called 1440, Scott Creens was the uh, person behind that, a successful entrepreneur. He came to Scotts Valley with these words, I want to get to quote, no, N-O, sooner rather than later. He wanted to ex explore all the bad things that could happen before he put millions of dollars into uh, a, a project. He ended up putting, I, you know, north of $50 million into Scotts Valley, into, into the old um, uh, campus, uh, college campus that we had here. It's been very, very successful. So with respect to looking at all the details, for example, um, Guy, you brought up the whole idea of rail operations. You know, rail operations take employees, right? And we've learned that, and Metro is probably a pretty good example of, I believe that they just, uh, was it 80 million or $100 million in uh, pension PERS that they had to renegotiate? Um, it, does this study, Speaking of, of operations, does this study take into account the deficit that's probably going to happen with CalPERS once you have a bureaucracy of, say, a, another 100 people? I'm just curious as to that's, is that part of the calculus? We definitely will be looking at the... Oh, I know what I did. We will be looking at the um, operation. Yeah. My voice dropped out there, guy. I unmuted myself on the computer <laughs> and on the microphone. Sorry about that. Uh, we definitely will be looking at the operations and maintenance costs. Um, we did so as part of the TCAA, and it's pretty significant. And when you look at it, an extended period of time, 20 or 30 years, um, the operations and maintenance will exceed that of the capital cost of the project. Um, pensions are included as part of uh, part of that. We'll uh, be assuming that it will be union labor, and um, and those uh, those individuals will will be able to draw pensions. So um, it is significant. We understand that. Um, you know, there there are you know opportunities to try to keep the the costs uh, down towards operations and maintenance. Um, we're looking at that too. It's why we often are criticized that we're trying to do too much out there, but I don't want to leave too much uh, um, out there to have to um, maintain after um, we start the system. Um, so, you know, since capital funds are easier to obtain, you know, we're looking at a lot of potential bridge replacements and whatnot. Um, but, uh, you know, back to a comment I made earlier, uh, people are, um, transit operators are screaming right now about, um, the state's insistence that operations and maintenance get funded from local governments. So maybe it'll be a rosier picture in a few years. I don't know. Don't have that crystal ball, but um, we definitely will be calculating the costs and uh, showing you the financial picture um, at the time that we present the material. Thank you. Commissioner McPherson. Yeah, uh, and thank you. I want to especially thank uh, Sarah Christensen and all the RTC staff for this 37 page report with plus charts, uh, really amazingly uh, detailed and is what we need to know. Uh, so we all appreciate that very much. I think this contract is uh, important, even at a cost higher than anticipated because it's imperative. We really know what a project of this scale will realistic cost to build and operate. I mean, I don't think that voters 
in particular said we want rail with measure d circa 2022 until we know uh, the, the cost the environmental impacts the the impact on private property rights as was mentioned by mr bertrand um but with so without an eir which identifies in real time all the challenges that um, and costs we're going to have i don't think we have a clear choice of whether or not passenger rail is feasible in Santa Cruz County uh, or affordable, uh, despite uh, the community rhetoric on both sides. And we had plenty of it earlier this year, of course, on Measure D. So I think having a scope of work on uh, the shelf will put us in the best possible position to uh, qualify for state money to do uh, an EIR. So um, I'm going to be supporting this recommendation. Um, and I, again, I want to thank uh, the staff for getting this comprehensive report. Uh, it's going to put us on track, uh, excuse the pun, uh, to decide really what we uh, should be or how we're going to make that decision and what give the public more, uh, more clear input and uh, information on what this is really going to cost, uh, and it, like I said, in uh, in a money sense, an environmental sense, and a property rights sense. I think it's those are clear and important issues that need to be more thoroughly addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to now take it out to the public for comments. Comments, and I um, will start with members of the public who are in the chambers. Uh, and I see a uh, member coming up is Sally Arnold. Welcome. Thank you. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation and it's had me scrolling for data on my phone while you were, were talking. And, you know, obviously con financial concerns are reasonable and, um, you know, appropriate for this group to consider. I really appreciate uh, that both uh, Ms. Christensen and, and Mr. Preston have been very clear about how there's a certain order of operations. You can't find the price of something if you don't know what the thing is yet. And so I really appreciate the thoroughness in which they're proposing this, you know, be approached. And I've been looking at um, the um, American Public Transit Association for some uh, kind of economic facts about public transit that sometimes get, you know, we, we think about the money we're spending within the RTC budget, but, or, you know, the state or federal money, but we forget that there's economic benefits to those investments. And I'll just read a few. Every dollar invested in public transportation generates $5 in economic returns. Every a billion dollar invested in public transportation supports and creates approximately 50,000 jobs. Every 10 million in capital investment in public transportation yields 30 million in increased business sales. Every 10 million in operating investment yields 32 million in increased business sales. And an estimated 32, 39 billion of public transit expenditures flow into the private sector, um, you know, through contracts and things like that. Home values are 24% higher near public transportation in other areas. Hotels in cities with direct rail access to the airport raise 11% more revenue per room than hotels in cities without. I mean, it just I could just keep scrolling, but I just want to point out that the, you're talking about an investment in our community. It's not, it is a public service, but there's also going to be economic returns. And we just need to think about the big picture. And I really appreciate everyone's thoughtful care today. And I hope we're going to get a positive vote on this issue. Thank you, Ms. Arnold. We have a um, number of members from the uh, virtual world who are, have called in. And so I'll start with our first caller, Marie Fontes. Mr. Fontes, you're on mute. So if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Chair Brown, I apologize. I didn't need to raise my hand. Oh, gotcha. Okay, thank you. No worries. Uh, so our next speaker, Mark Masidi Miller. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Greetings, Chair Brown, commissioners, and commissioner alternates. My name is Mark Masidi Miller with the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. For the last 20 years, Ford has been a steady advocate for transforming our 32-mile rail corridor into a modern rail-with-trail transportation facility to enhance mobility, 
to improve safety, especially for cyclists and pedestrians, and to create a more sustainable and more equitable community. Today, Ford urges this commission to fully support and approve all staff recommendations. Your approval of staff's recommendations will be another very important step toward realizing the community's vision of fully utilizing the existing rail corridor with benefits for everyone. While many folks think of this effort as focused on the implementation of passenger rail, Ford appreciates that approving staff's recommendation will also move the preliminary design and environmental documentation needed to complete all remaining segments of the rail trail. A rail trail that will connect our neighborhoods, neighborhoods full of people, young and old, families with children, with a safe, car-free path to schools, parks, and shops along the rail corridor between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. Regarding ridership recovery, every market is different. LA is, a, is receiving a third more transit ridership than the Bay Area. You know, Santa Cruz is its own unique market. Metro just told us that they're on track to do a phenomenal recovery of COVID. Uh, from their COVID ridership. So we urge you, let's move forward. Let's gather the facts. Let's keep everyone moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Judy Gittleson. Good morning, commissioners. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, I am a Watsonville resident, train enthusiast, and one of the over 70% of your voters, your constituents who voted to support keeping the tracks. I am thrilled with the progress you're making, and I wholly support uh, approving the staff recommendations. I have three questions. In the um, 2016 Measure D, was the preservation of the branch line, was that, um, I, I heard the talk about how money moves from one pot to another, but was money for uh, maintaining the, especially the trestles and the tracks, was it taken away from the train money? That's one question. And then the other question is, um, uh, how many of you rode that TIG M demonstration train last year. It was amazing. It was quiet. It has zero emissions. And from my understanding, that train could be in place uh, for a million dollars a car or something like that. Anyway, don't quote me on that, but I just think it's fantastic. Sarah Christian, your report is fantastic. Can the public access that report? And then... Um, I think that this period of climate change, of increase of uh, population, I think that the ridership analysis, uh, it will just, you know, we will be so happy to not be spending an hour and a half coming from Santa Cruz to Watsonville on Highway 1 with this as an alternative. So I am thrilled. I think it's feasible. I think there is a bright future for rail. I think Santa Cruz County can show the world how it can be done. And I wish you the best and I wholly encourage the acceptance and approval of this staff report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gittleson. And I um, am just saving questions for the end if there are questions that we um, that come up during public comment. So we'll cover those in a bit. And I will next call on Michael Lewis and Jean Brocklebank. Oh, was I supposed to go up, right? Hi, this is Jean Brocklebank speaking. Two things, first about borrowing, and secondly about environmental impacts. Um, borrowing was kind of sloughed off as, oh, well, we can borrow money. But borrowing means going into debt. And that means that the RTC and the taxpayers will be going into debt. I am conservative very physically, and I don't like that idea. And I don't recall that when we voted for Measure D that we were told that we would borrow 
and go into debt with the money that the taxpayers um, provide. The other is environmental impacts. Um, uh, that was mentioned. Uh, we already know the environmental impacts of uh, pursuing both a rail and a trail in this corridor. Uh, the environmental impacts are huge and um, they involve they involve that everything that was uh, mentioned by the previous speaker in terms of climate change, where we're going to deforest the corridor and release carbon that's stored in trees and release carbon that was stored in the soil. And so we're already aware of some of the environmental impacts. I'm very uncomfortable with the idea of borrowing Measure D money. Uh, and I think we ought to uh, think twice, three times or four times about doing so. I can't support this recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rocklebank. So our next caller is uh, Brian from Trail Now. Yes, Sorry, I hi, this you. is Brian. Your, your hand was hiding on my screen, so. Okay, thanks, up. this is Brian from Trail Now. You know, when we talk about risk management, there are terms that we use, realized risk, and unrealized risk. So a realized risk is no longer a risk. We already know it exists. And that's the situation we have here already. We already know the Coastal Commission rules that they won't allow the rail going through there. So that's not a risk anymore, that's a fact. We already know that you're gonna be destroying historical trestles. That's not a risk, that's a fact. We already know that you're gonna, that we've already spent $3 million on multiple studies. So we already know those, those facts. We already know the risk of, it's not a risk anymore. We heard Guy Preston say, it's not gonna be slow moving light rail. It's gonna be fast moving train. Can you imagine a 60 mile an hour train speeding through our little neighborhoods? That's, a, that's not a risk, that's a fact. They're very dangerous. We already know it's a fact that the Coastal Commission will not allow the fencing that will be required. So when you put this rail in, you're gonna be required to put big walls up, big fencing that's gonna separate the, the, the beach from the public. And the Coastal Commission is not gonna allow that. So you keep saying that we need to spend the money to understand the risks and to, but we already know it, they're not risks, they're facts. So I think you, we all need to step back a little bit and say, is it worth the seven million? It's not three million, the $7 million commitment. So I think you need to go back and start what I heard Supervisor McPherson suggest is go to the Coastal Commission and ask them the, the likelihood that this, that this will happen. The other risk you have that's really not a risk either is you're not gonna be competitive against those existing rails. When you go try to get grants, they're not gonna give you the money because the Coastal Commission is gonna be standing there saying, we're not gonna approve this. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Our next caller is David Date. Good morning, commissioners. I'm calling from the intersection of San Andreas and uh, Mar Monte in La Selva Beach. Uh, there's a bus stop that was discontinued here in September of 2015. Uh, since then, the bench has been removed and the signs have been removed. So maybe there's no intention to restore bus service here. Um, that was kind of uh, echoed as a condition of the passage of the 2016 Measure D was that this would actually fund the, the or allow our buses to come back. And, and there appears to be no intention to do that. There's a pothole swarm across the street here. They're full of water. There's cracks in the road. So the rain is permeating into the base rock and, 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 and causing unspeakable amounts of damage to the base rock and the roads. I'm a half mile from the Manresa washout that Brian just mentioned. Uh, can this commission honestly say that we're in a position to invest millions more dollars in a study of trains when we, it's so clear that our county roads and our transportation infrastructure are in complete shambles. Um, so that's, 
that's really what's on top of my mind. Um, and you know, I guess I guess to understand what's happening, I, I, I guess I, I kind of looked to the opposition and I saw this quote from a, you know, I call him the chief train lobbyist, Barry Scott. And on next door, he commented, their game plan is to encourage as expensive a system as could possibly be. Instead of privatizing the rail quarter at half the cost, Fort and others need to get behind Roaring Camp and make sure that at the end of the progressive contract in 2028, another freight operator is selected, hopefully with experience and popularity. So here are the primary train advocates saying that there's not going to be a commuter train in 2028. There's not going to be a commuter train in 2038. We're going to continue to lock up the corridor with freight agreements, even though there's no freight service and everything's falling into shambles. So what we need to do is prioritize the construction. We don't have to pull the, ra the rails everywhere, but we do need to prioritize the construction of the trail on existing trestles and infrastructure and keep the rails where, where it's possible. Possible. And and that's the only thing that we can do in the near term to really get Santa Cruz moving. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Date. Um, Michael Saint, you are up. Uh, thank you, okay. Chair Brown. Uh, yeah, I was looking at Carrie Pico's slides and stuff, and this is really a conundrum with the kind of the. Um, differences between highway widening versus the rail corridor and multimodal situations. You, you have to decide to do one or the other. If you are supporting both highway widening as well as trying to do the rail corridor, you're kind of fighting yourselves. Um, widening the highway is actually going to uh, take mass transit people away and not really want people to get on the rail. Because if you ease up that highway for a while, you're just kicking the can down the road. Um, he said 20 to 30% at the fish hook continues straight. Those are the people you need to get off the highway. These people are, a lot of them are getting off at 41st, Morrissey, Soquel Avenue, and around the fish hook to Santa Cruz. There needs to be some type of mass transit to take care of those people, and it has to be as good as take, getting in a car. The main thing, it's kind of simple. I try to simplify things. You need to get the people out of their cars. And you need to move people and not cars, which was emphasized by one of our commissioners a couple of years ago. Um, you know for sure that what won't work, and in the future, it's been proven over and over again, been studied ad nauseum, that widening the highways will fail. You don't have a problem putting a million or half a billion dollars into widening infrastructure for cars, but you're having a problem putting it on the rail. Um, that's the issue. I mean, it's as simple as that. Also, I wanted to talk during the Caltrans thing about safety. Well, it's nice. They have good thoughts about having meetings and safety and CHP. But if you take people out of cars, put them on mass transit, your safety problem is taken care of. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Saint. Our next speaker is Ben Vernaza. Good morning, everybody. Um, in a sense, I've been a resident since 1933. My mother was pregnant. My mother and father came down and stayed in Capitola. Uh, but that's not my, my reason for talking today. I have been a resident since 1967. Now, you're taking <clears throat> from metro and highways which is part of the expenditure plan. And the ordinance, I'm reading from the ordinance now, the ordinance and expenditure plan may only be amended if required by the following process set forth in section 18207 of the Public Utilities Code. One, initiation of amendments by the authority reciting findings of necessity. Two, provisions of notice and copy of the amendments provided to the Board of Supervisors and City Councils in Santa Cruz County. Three, the proposed amendments shall become effective 45 days after notice is given. Amendments shall require a two-thirds vote of the total membership of the authority. So I think you better take a look at that to see if that's applicable in this case, since you're taking money from Metro, you're taking money 
from highways with the probability or possibility, maybe that's a better expression, of having a problem later on. And if you haven't have a two thirds majority to go ahead with this, then that may be very well be a problem. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Vernaza. Our next speaker is Equity Transit. Thank you, Chair, Chair Brown. I appreciate your service. Uh, with all due respect, with regards to a repeat of history, I would urge the Commission to look at details and data from organizations like the APTA, the Labor Network for Sustainability, LA DOT, and civil rights, environmental, and labor organizations across the nation. The research is clear. Public transportation is a critical lifeline for many in our community, and it is a critical way to mitigate the ongoing systemization of racism and classism in this country due to the destruction of our once great public transit systems under the forces of an automobile centric industries. You can see some of the links to these resources and data available at equitytransit.org. Somewhere around 20% of our entire national and local populations depend on public transportation in order to access essential life opportunities, jobs, education, important community and civic activities. Access to robot Robust public transit is a civil right and one which around the 1950s was systemically systematically destroyed across this country. Underserved members of our community remain stuck, unable to access opportunities because of the disconnect and lack of awareness of a wealthier, mostly whiter contingent of our population that holds most of the power in our governmental systems. Those with the wealth to buy a car seem completely unaware of the lived reality a great percentage of our communities face with a lack Lack of 15 minute public transit systems. Research is clear. As Sally mentioned earlier, she gave some great um, resources and I urge you to look at those. I'm very concerned when I hear elected leaders seemingly disconnected from this reality around public transit, which is essential to our essential workers, community members with disabilities, people of lower income, our elderly, people who cannot or do not want to drive. Public transit is essential to our environment. Um, I'm just going to skip forward. We all pay into this extensive system. Unfortunately, a majority of the members of our community who require and need and rely on public transit are unable to afford to come to these meetings. And so I speak on their behalf. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, our next speaker is Saladin Sale. Welcome. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Chair Brown, commissioners, alternates, and RTC staff. My name is Saladin Sale. I live in the city of Santa Cruz. I want to voice my support for the staff recommendations for this agenda item. Acting today to take the next steps in moving this investment in the long-term quality of life in Santa Cruz County forward represents the very best of long-term thinking. In history, there are moments of plasticity where certain decisions having long-term effect on the future quality of life are most impactful. This is one such moment. There's likely a long history ahead for Santa Cruz County, and life for future generations may be very good or very bad, in part because of your actions today. While those of us here are already enjoying decisions made in earlier years, which have led to the sections of rail trail already completed and protection of the rail, the results of today's actions will benefit untold more in terms of quality of life, both locally and within the global environment. Thankfully, we now know the overwhelming public support in our county for long-termism in the realm of transportation planning and delivery. Please acknowledge and then respectfully disregard the urgings of those remaining few who are unable to see the value of investments whose reach exceeds the span of just their own lives. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sale. Our next speaker up is David Loves Public Transport. Welcome. Uh, uh, good uh, afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Yeah, this is uh, David Van Brink. I'm calling in off-site uh, in beautiful, cold Bentonville, Arkansas. I'll be home next week. Um, so yeah, cars are so-so. They're kind of killing our planet. Public transit has to keep evolving. So this is great. Please keep moving forward. Thanks. Thank you. Enjoy your travels. <laughs> um, Mr. Otto, Keith Otto, you are up next. Yes, quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great, thanks. Greetings, Keith Otto County resident. The item before the commission includes an engineering services contract for electric passenger rail transit. Let's remember that the 2016 Measure D expenditure plan states, measure revenues do not include funding for any new train rail service. Now, if the proposed contract is to be characterized as analysis, we should ask ourselves if that is really the case. Will the outcome of this contract before you today truly inform future decisions? For example, consider this. Do we really think there will be substantial new information such that, say, a commissioner who in the past voted against the train then with this new information may then vote for it. And conversely, a commissioner who in the past voted for the train, again, with this new information may then vote against it. If not, then we're simply starting yet another study, or rather starting just the first part, the first year of only an, addition, an initial study for task one. I'll say that the frog in the warming pot of hot water comes to mind. I hope all have read the full 53 pages for this item. Please carefully consider your vote on this item. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Otto. And it looks like that concludes our public comment on this item item 20 on our agenda. And so I'll bring it back to the commission for deliberation and action uh, with the staff recommendation. <laughs> second. I'll, uh, the second. Okay, so we have a motion by Commissioner Schiffer and a second by commission. I'm gonna give it to Commissioner Caput, your last meeting and um, ask for any additional comments with the, just a reminder that our question and answer portion of this agenda item did include, involve a lot of comments. So if we could keep them uh, short or and or additions, um, we'll go ahead and uh, uh, call on Commissioner Koenig. Thank you, Chair Brown. It's no secret that I'm a rail skeptic. However, I am gonna vote for this today because first of all, this is money that has been allocated for rail including studies, and I think an environmental impact report certainly qualifies uh, as a study. And this money is not gonna be allocated for anything other than rail until we do this level of analysis to determine whether it's feasible or not. We're not changing the expenditure plan. Any money that we're taking away from the highway funds are considered a loan, and that would be paid back from the rail fund to the highway fund in future years or from whatever category it comes from. And also in regards to going into debt, this is not a case where we're borrowing money from someone else. We're just talking about moving money from one category of funding to another on a short-term basis, but that money would ultimately be paid back. With interest. Right. Uh, so second, I'll support it because I think it will provide a significant amount of new data, including <clears throat> detailed review of the status of all the trestles, information about environmental issues in Harkins Slough and along the many recent bluffs and updated ridership and projection costs. And third, because I hope the data will help our community to build consensus on the best way forward, not only here among commissioners, but also among voters, because ultimately it's the initiatives that we vote yes on that make the biggest difference. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, I did wanna just, before we take the vote, um, I'm, I'm in support of this agenda item and I won't repeat uh, what, other commissioners have already said about, you know, I do believe this is going to give us more information that will be useful in making decisions. And um, I wanted to make sure, though, that um, the kind of questions that came up 
that can be answered that we could we could speak to. And most I, what I heard mostly what, as I was taking my notes was, um, you know, questions around uh, the funding pots and the question about uh, borrowing against Measure D uh, prospective revenues. And we have discussed these items in uh, great detail uh, on more than one occasion. Um, and we, I imagine we'll continue to have those in-depth conversations as we make decisions about potential bonding um, and moving, uh, you know, moving funds or borrowing from different pots of funding. Um, but I, I did want to just, um, ask for clarification on the a point that one caller made, uh, Mr. Vernaza, about um, the, just our, our clarification on the amendments language and um, make sure that we, you, I, I imagine that's, you've got a, something that you can share with us to make us sure. comfortable about that. If we were um, permanently moving funding from one category to another, that would Absolutely. require an amendment. Um, or if we were adding a project to a category or, or something to that extent. And th that's all spelled out in the um, referenced uh, code that he mentioned. Uh, we have done that one time. Uh, we added projects uh, to Highway 1 category, um, and we went through that, that process. Um, Interprogram loans are a mechanism to deliver projects. The money is being paid back, as Commissioner Koenig noted, uh, with interest. So um, there is uh, no need to amend the expenditure plan for that purpose. It's covered also in our strategic implementation plan. The policy is spelled out in the staff report. Uh, bonding also is uh, section 10 of the ordinance. So we can, can borrow outside of the uh, um, measure itself, um, and that is anticipated um, as we continue to receive grants um, for various programs moving forward. Thank you. I, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear for members of the public since it, it did raise a potential question in people's minds. Um, so I will go ahead and then, um, I, I did actually want to just say one more thing about this question around funding and um, the you know the scarcity and and uh, the kind of t the idea that taking money from one pot means that we're uh, not able to spend on others and so and I I get that that's a very significant concern and I take that very seriously but I also want to just remind us that um, some of these expenditures uh, that we're making and and hopefully all of them will actually generate um, not just the the kind of economic benefits. Um, that, that we should be thinking about the, the multiplier effects, but we'll be able to bring draw down significant dollars. And we've talked about that, but I just, in my conversations and kind of when I put it all together, um, I feel very, very confident that our RTC staff, our team is um, equipped to uh, make the best decisions in this planning process to help us draw down additional funds uh, to be competitive in funding uh, rounds, grant funding rounds. And so I do think that there that while those concerns are very legitimate, we should also be thinking about these opportunities as well to bring money into our community. So um, I just wanted to add that since it hadn't been said uh, in explicitly. And with that, um, actually, now I do see a few more uh, hands up. Sorry to get the <laughs> to get the comments started. Um, I will uh, call on Commissioner Caput and Commissioner Hurst and hopefully we can take a vote soon. You bet. Um, anyway, uh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, basically, uh, what I'm, I'll make this quick. Uh, the voters made it very clear that they want us to go forward with uh, uh, looking at the rail and all the options. Uh, to vote no, really, uh, for our uh, commission here is really not an option. Uh, we're basically saying... Uh, the voters didn't know what they were voting on. Uh, they, the voters do analyze when they go to the polls and they read a lot of information. They know what they voted on. And uh, for us as a commission to say that the 20, uh, 28 or 29 percent that don't want us to go forward uh, were correct and the 72 percent were incorrect. Um, we, we, we really can't do that. It, you know, even if you don't want to have rail or even uh, pursue it, 
uh, to, to vote no uh, and be on this commission, uh, to me, it is just, uh, it seems like it would be this, a slap in the face to the voters. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Caput. Uh, Mr. Commissioner Hurst, you're up. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Chair. And I want to thank staff for uh, a very well-prepared uh, agenda today. I know that there's always apprehension by the public and there's certainly uh, fear and, and self-interest uh, showing as well. But let's all think about the future and safety and equity and connectivity and, and really getting people moving. And so that should be our job. Let's get people moving. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hurst. I will now call for a vote on this item. Commissioner Batram. I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown. Aye. Commissioner Hurst. Yes, aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson. No. Commissioner Koenig. Aye. Commissioner Quinn. Yes. Commissioner Schifrin. Aye. Commissioner Caput. Aye. Commissioner McPherson. Commissioner Parker. Um, yes. Commissioner Kristen Brown. Aye. Commissioner Rotkin. Aye. The motion is approved with one no. And then you know, yeses. Right. Thank you. We will now move on to item 21. This is a construction contract award for the Pajaro River Bridge Rehabilitation Project along the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and Senior Transportation Engineer Sarah Christensen will give us a report on this as well. Busy hey, day. you gotta take a picture of the iPhone? <laughs> Thank you, Chair Brown. Screenshot. Commissioner you Hernandez, did you have a question? Okay, gotcha, sorry. Okay, thank you, Chair Brown. Um, this item is uh, being recommended to the commission today uh, to award this construction contract for rehabilitation of the Pajaro River Bridge. No PowerPoint, thank goodness. Um, we've had enough trouble today. Um, as you may remember, uh, we advertised this project earlier this year. Uh, staff um, recommended rejecting the one bid that we did receive, um, the bid was very high, um, much higher than the engineer's estimate. It was $1,709,470. Uh, the commission directed staff to um, evaluate, reevaluate the scope of work um, and try to re-advertise a more competitive construction contract, which is what we um, we did. So we found um, after talking to a few uh, contractors, there was a lack of interest due to um, the specialized work. We um, developed a scaled down scope of work. Uh, we removed some of the specialized work. Um, the timber work seems to be really a niche. Um, and so we uh, removed basically all the timber replacement work. Um, we do have some pile banding and that's about it for the uh, timber rehabilitation. Um, and so we put this project back out to bid um, and we received another one single bid. This one was much more um, competitive. So it was $287,885 from a uh, contractor called Eurostyle Management. This amount is under the engineer's estimate and staff recommends accepting the bid and awarding the contract. And that concludes my staff report. Thank you, Ms. Christensen. Are there any commissioner questions? Or, okay, I don't see any. So uh, we'll ask if there are members of the public who'd like to speak. I see uh, Mark Masidi Miller is up first. Greetings again, Chair Brown, Commissioners, and Commissioner Alternates. Um, once again, I just wanted to let you know I'm with the Santa Cruz County Friends of the Rail and Trail. We urge you to support the staff's recommendation on this item. And we just wanted to encourage uh, the continued working with and collaborating with the Roaring Camp Railroad. Um, they have a, a ton of experience and expertise 
And uh, we understand that this revised scope of work saving a million dollars or so was developed by consulting with them uh, regarding this project. So we just wanna encourage you to continue collaborating with, with the local experts at Roaring Camp. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, and this will be our, our last commenter, um, unless somebody wants to raise their hand. Okay, we've got two. <laughs> um, Brian from Trail Now. <laughs> Hi, this is Brian. I'll keep it short so nobody jumps in there. Um, so the interesting thing to note here is that the CTC has a short line railroad improvement fund. And you know why they do that is because short line railroad is not a very good business. The profit is very low, and we've seen that with the many with progressive rail trying to leave. So I guess the question would be is staff, are we getting, we're not getting the volume, freight volume reports out. Can we get more of that information to understand, you know, when us taxpayers are supporting a short line operator that really isn't a very good business. You know, if you go and walk this section, it's a beautiful section and and if we were to connect that as a trail and even a access road, it would be phenomenal for San Watsonville. There's a school right there. Um, it really separates the neighborhoods. I, I watch people and they have to walk across this crickly old um, trestle. And it would be very good if, if our community, the Watsonville community had this as an access road and a trail. Um, the freight business is not very profitable there. You know, maybe look at in the long term, look at trucking that can come from the Union Pacific rail yard just half a mile away. So it's something to think about. Remember that uh, progressive, uh, one of the other questions is, is progressive throwing any money into improving the, the railroad there? Um, I know the rails are really, going through the road, it's it's tremendous uh, damage to those roadways. And it's it's not ideal for the community. So again, thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is Judy Gittleson. Hello again, commissioners. I don't know, can you hear? Okay, there's the time yep. clock. Hello again, commissioners. Just a quick question. Are these reports available to the community? Is there a website where we can peek at them? And I completely support um, endorsing repairing this. So thank you. That's all. Thank you. Just want to check. Are you talking about the, the freight report, volume the reports? The freight report and the EIR or whatever you call the previous report that... Uh, was about the the one that the measure that was approved the gotcha thank you thank you thanks for the clarification so it, can we um can just to to ask and since it came up um the freight volume reports are those available and then the I mean, I know all of our other inf background information is available, but um the freight reports I'm not sure where those would be Luis Mendez can respond on that. And Great. Yet, I think the, there were a couple of questions. One was about the staff reports. The staff reports are on their website um, for all the items that were on the, on the agenda today. So we can go to that. For the freight reports, we do uh, get quarterly freight reports from um, Progressive Rail. And they'll, we don't uh, put those on our website, but they, they are probably they can be provided to anyone who would like them. Great. So if you'd like that information, uh, please feel free to reach out, make that request. Okay, bring it back to the commission for action and deliberation Move Deliber or action, hopefully. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on this item and we'll take a roll call. And just to clarify, was that Rockin's? Rockin was the motion. It was, sorry, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, Commissioner Rockin motion and Commissioner Koenig second. Okay, um, Commissioner Bertrand. I approve. Commissioner Sandy Brown? Aye. Commissioner Hurst? Aye. Commissioner Randy Johnson? Aye. Commissioner Koenig? Aye. Commissioner Quinn? Aye. Commissioner Schifrin? Aye. Commissioner Caput? Aye. Commissioner McPherson? Aye. Commissioner Parker?
Commissioner Parker, you might be muted. She may be. Or she looks like line. she's gone. She might be gone. Um, I don't see her picture. Yeah. Commissioner Pegler? Aye. Commissioner Kristen Brown? Aye. And Commissioner Rockin? Aye. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. So our next item is uh, 21A, items to be discussed in closed session. I'll ask Mr. Mattis for a report on those items. Thank you. We have sure, this one closed session item covering three properties and the potential for real property acquisitions. And we do anticipate that there may be a report out of closed session as well, too. Yes, thank you. So in ter just to, um, for other commissioners benefit um, for the report out, we, we won't need to come all come back for an act a public action. We'll just report out so that you and correct. I can come back. The staff okay. and the chair can come okay. back and report and, out and if there's a reportable action. And do we have an email with the uh, uh, Zoom address for this meeting in closed session? You, yes, we did receive, or I did, a message, yeah, and the, the I can forward it to you now. Um, anybody who needs it, I can forward it. So just let me know. It came in about nine this morning from CTV, at least on mine. Uh, I'm sure not probably, seeing yeah, it, so I would just, appreciate somebody resending it to me. We'll, we'll make sure everybody's got the link. And um, are we going to be going into, I think we were out here last time because of the... Uh, capabilities for with internet uh we're going to remain in this room so we will okay so we'll, we'll remain here room. um but we'll, we'll clear the room and um get started on that item if we can just, just take a like moment a and we'll, we'll yeah we'll take a five minute break um to sort out this make sure everyone has the, the link and um so i know mike you need it anybody else need it i'll email right now to make sure you get it Okay, Supervisor uh, elect uh, Hernandez, uh, you can do a close okay. session, right? I, I have it. to run to a meeting. I got to go. Okay. Thank okay. you. And um, just for those out there, the um, the email was we got one at seven this morning. Uh, it's CTV webinars is the sender. Okay. And I'll okay. forward to you. I got the one you just sent. Thank you very much. Okay. Cool. Uh, welcome back. We are here to uh, report out on the closed session from our uh, RTC meeting. And I will turn it over to Steve Mattis, our counsel, for a report. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the commission was in closed session for real property negotiations related to properties at 7992, 7994, and 7996 Soquel Drive. Um, as part of the closed session by an 11-0 vote of the commission, the commission authorized the staff to obtain appraisals, make formal offers to purchase the fee interest in the properties, obtain rights of entry from the property owners to perform uh, physical assessments of the property, and, and to negotiate and then present to the commission if the parties are able to come to an agreement, a purchase and sell agreement for the properties. The um, the purchase and sell agreement terms would be uh, associated with the with the um, appraisal itself that the RTC would obtain, and as part of this, to obtain those appraisals, the commission also authorized the staff to um, enter into contracts for right of way services either with ARWS or the County of Santa Cruz um, in an amount not to exceed one hundred and fifty seven thousand five hundred dollars for. Uh, the appraisals and the right of way acquisition activities that are necessary. And with that, Madam Chair, that's the report out of closed session. All right, thank you. So our final item is 22C next meeting. That will be our, our next Regional Transportation Commission meeting scheduled for Thursday, January 12th, 2023 at 9 a.m. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to break the gap.